Ed Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions will come to order. Uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Mr. Bansell, the CEO of Moderna, for being with us uh, today, and all the other panelists uh, who will be joining us. Uh, Mr. Bansell very early on agreed to be here voluntarily, and I appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity so there is no confusion to congratulate Moderna, Pfizer, other companies, and the great scientists at the National Institute of Health and other federal agencies for their extraordinary work in rapidly producing COVID vaccines that have saved millions of lives. We should be grateful to all those in government and in the private sector who work so hard uh, to save lives. This hearing, uh, to my mind, is about several enormously important and interrelated issues that are on the minds uh, of the American people. In the pharmaceutical industry today, we are looking at an unprecedented level of corporate greed. And that is certainly true with Moderna. Today, according to a recent survey, 37% of the American people could not afford the prescription drugs their doctors prescribe. Got that? Over one third of the American people can't fill their prescription drugs that their doctors prescribe. Meanwhile, 10 major pharmaceutical companies made over $100 billion in profit in 2021, a 137% increase from the previous year. In these same corporations, the 50 top executives made over $1.9 billion in total compensation in 2021 and are in line to receive billions more in golden parachutes once they leave their companies. In other words, all over this country, in Vermont and in every state represented here, people are getting sicker and in some cases dying because they cannot afford the outrageous cost of prescription drugs while these companies make huge profits and the executives become billionaires. Further, and many Americans don't know this, the taxpayers of our country have spent many tens of billions of dollars over the past decade to research and to develop life-saving medicine. And in my view, that is a good investment. Yet, despite that huge amounts of money and the vitally important work done by the National Institute of Health Scientists, the citizens of the United States pay far more for prescription drugs than do the people of any other country on Earth, in some cases, 10 times more for the same exact drug. Unbelievably, there are important life-saving drugs on the market today that literally cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, cancer drugs and other types of drugs. And my simple question is, what does a life-saving drug mean for a person who cannot afford that drug. You have all the great drugs out there in the world, but if you can't afford it, what does it mean? Now, in terms of Moderna, the focus of our attention this morning, let us be clear. The NIH and other federal agencies work with Moderna to research, develop, and distribute the COVID vaccine that so many of our people have effectively used. While Moderna may wish to rewrite history, it is widely acknowledged that both Moderna and the NIH created this vaccine together. According to a letter I received from the NIH on March 17th, and which has been distributed to all members of the committee, three scientists at the NIH, quote, are co-inventors, end quote, of this vaccine, who were, quote, integral members of a collaborative team of scientists working to design and produce the vaccine. In other words, this vaccine would not exist without NIH's partnership and expertise and the substantial investment of the taxpayers of this country. 
as a matter of public record, U.S. taxpayers spent $12 billion on the research, development, and procurement of the NIH Moderna COVID vaccine. And here is the thank you that the taxpayers of this country received from Moderna for that huge investment. They are thanking the taxpayers of the United States by proposing to quadruple the price of the COVID vaccine to as much as $130 once the government stockpile runs out. At a time when it costs less than $3 to manufacture the vaccine. $3 to manufacture it, $130 on the market. What this means is that Moderna will be charging Medicare, Medicaid, the VA, the Department of Defense, the Indian Health Service, and insurance plans, private insurance plans on the Affordable Care Act, billions of dollars more for the COVID vaccine. So all of us who are concerned about the deficit, the national debt, billions more goes to Moderna. Meanwhile, Moderna has already made $21 billion in profits off the COVID vaccine during the pandemic, and four of Moderna's executives and investors collectively became more than $10 billion wealthier as a result of the massive taxpayer investment <clears throat> into that corporation. As soon as Moderna started to receive billions of dollars from the federal government, Mr. Bansell literally became a billionaire overnight and is now worth over $4 billion. He was also able to secure a golden parachute for himself worth another $926 million after he leaves the company. But let's be clear, Mr. Bansell is not alone. One of Moderna's co-founders, Nuba Afayan, is now worth $1.8 billion. Another co-founder, Mr. Langer, is now worth $1.7 billion. And one of the founding investors in Moderna, Tim Springer, is now worth $2.2 billion. None of these four individuals were billionaires before the taxpayers of our country funded the COVID-19 vaccine. This type of profiteering and excessive CEO compensation is exactly what the American people, whether they're Republicans, Democrats, or independents, are sick and tired of. And that is why this morning I will be asking Moderna and Mr. Bansell to reconsider their decision to quadruple the price of this vaccine and not raise the price at all. Let me mention that after this hearing was announced, Moderna uh, pledged that its, quote, vaccines and boosters will continue to be available at no cost for the vast majority of people in the United States, end quote, through the creation of a patient assistance program. That is good news. The bad news is that most patient assistance programs are poorly designed and extremely difficult, and I will be asking Mr. Bansell to make certain that this patient assistance program is simple, non-bureaucratic, and in fact gets out to the people who need it. Let me pose, if I might, a moral question that we ask too rarely, but that I hope that this committee will address in the months in front of us. And that is, above and beyond the COVID vaccine, should people in our country and around the world get sicker and sometimes die because they cannot afford the outrageous prices that the drug companies are charging. Is it morally acceptable to say, I have a drug here that can cure you, save your life, and I'm sorry you can't afford the $50,000 that it costs? Is that the moral values of the United States of America? And I would contrast that attitude that we see today from Moderna and virtually all the other drug companies with what Jonas Salt said when he invented the polio vaccine that had such a profound impact. And you know what he got for inventing the polio vaccine? He got nothing. And he was proud of it. He gave a gift to the world that saved God knows how many lives. So I think we need to do some moral thinking about the role of the drug companies in our society, and I hope this committee will get into that. Uh, and with that, uh, let me uh, give the mic over to Senator Cassidy. Thank you, Chair Sanders. Um, you know, I'm a physician. I worked for over two decades in a hospital for the uninsured, those poorly insured on Medicaid. So I'm very familiar with this issue. 
Um, we share the concerns. Americans pay too much for prescription drugs and the medicines we depend upon. So today we're asking questions of Mr. Bensell. What price does Moderna plan to charge when the vaccine goes to the commercial market? And how did the company arrive at that price? And why is it different than the price that the government, charged, was, that the government uh, was charged? Now, Moderna announced recently it'll provide the vaccine at no cost to patients. How will the company implement this? They are fair questions. And hopefully at the end of this hearing, we will have a better understanding of these issues. But I'm also, let's just kind of think about the process here. The title is Taxpayers Paid Billions for It, So Why Would Moderna Consider Quadrupling the Price of the COVID Vaccine? Now, frankly, this presumes guilt in its title before we have learned. I'm a physician. I don't leap to a diagnosis before I take a careful history and physical. This is more like a show trial and a public shaming than a fact-finding mission. And it should be the goal of this committee to first fact-find before we attempt to hold someone guilty. The chair speaks of corporate greed in the context of over 1 million Americans who tragically died during the pandemic. I don't see the link. I just don't. The vaccine was available. As soon as it was available, it was implemented and lives began to be saved. It's hard to say that corporate greed was implicated before the vaccine was actually passed. It's important for us not to allow rhetoric to distort our analysis of the situation. This should be a fact-finding hearing. I do see a link between millions of lives saved because of the quick development of a vaccine made here in the United States. COVID-19 cost the U.S. economy an estimated $26 billion a day between 2020 and 2021. In this light, a study by the International Monetary Fund showed that Operation Warp Speed and the taxpayer dollars spent to support the vaccines would have paid for itself had it cut the duration of the pandemic by 12 hours. By 12 hours? We got a bargain here. An expensive bargain? No, a cheap bargain relative to that which it costs us every day. And considering that the initial estimates for the development of a vaccine were three to 10 years, thanks to Operation Warp Speed, private industry, American capitalism, things that we had done as a committee on a bipartisan basis to give tools to FDA and BARDA, the world's leading COVID vaccines were developed and distributed in less than one year, and taxpayer returns on investment were incalculable. Now, it's easy to criticize and decry capitalism, but it is the reason that we developed multiple world-leading vaccines in 10 months and is the reason that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Americans, are still alive today. This would not be had it not been for this process and for these vaccines. But cost is an issue. Let's just not paper over that. I can criticize the process, but I agree, cost is an issue. And during my decades treating the uninsured, I had patients who could not afford the drugs prescribed. And my nurse and I would sit on the phone for sometimes hours with insurance companies trying to get the authorization so that they could get their drugs. But I've also seen when a drug has not been invented, so to speak, where there are no other options, when there was a death sentence or a life of chronic disease because a medicine to treat the chronic illness or condition did not exist. Then, maybe a few years later, maybe many years later, I'd be with a different patient in a different exam room with the same diagnosis but now that drug had been invented, and a formerly fatal disease was now treatable and a relic of the past. Why? Because in the interim, treatments developed for their condition. Now, it's easy to put the COVID vaccine as one of these success stories, but it happened over 10 months. At first, we had no way to prevent. 10 months later, there it was. It seems like we in this committee need to keep the bigger picture in mind.
opportunities to step up and do something quickly and put everything aside. Moderna was one of those country, companies. We authorized grant funding. We set the groundwork for public-private partnerships. We stood up new institutions, all with the purpose that if something like a pandemic happened, something would be quickly developed. Well, when we did it in 2020, Moderna responded to their credit. I'm not defending any salaries. I'm defending any profit. What I am defending and pointing out is a great benefit our country and the world received from this technology that was translated out of a lab into clinical practice. Others did not make the same choice as Moderna. Uh, and I will say, it is important that through this hearing and otherwise that we do not send a hostile signal to future prospective partners. You say coming back at you. That would mean a future company how Moderna will price their vaccine post-commercialization. We're interested in that. We've never been in this situation before where a company has taken the reins back from the federal government after the federal government controlled distribution of the product. But this is not the time to discuss eliminating intellectual property rights or destroying business models of those whom our country will need to respond to the next pandemic and to develop the next life-changing cure. And we can't live in a fantasy world and pretend that what we do in this committee will not affect those future decisions. I want people to know that this committee is doing whatever it can to encourage cures for cancer, Alzheimer's, ALS, and other devastating disease. And if they do, and if a private company does it, they shall be rewarded. Lives depend upon it. Senator Sanders, um, we have pledged to work together. But I will say that if the purpose of the hearing is to demonize capitalism, we should not hate the thought of a person or a company making a profit that we lose sight of the ideas and accomplishments that their profit is rewarding. We can't be a country that encourages citizens and companies to succeed and step up and make a difference and then shames them when they do. If we want to consider real policies that work to lower the cost Americans pay for medicines, uh, let's work together. Thanks, and I look forward to hearing from our witness. Thank you very much, Senator Cassidy. Uh, we will now turn to our witness, Mr. Stefan Mansell, is the Chief Executive Officer of Moderna. Mr. Mansell, thank you very much for being with us. You may proceed with your testimony. Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, distinguished members of the committee, good morning. My name is Stefan Mansell, and I'm the CEO of Moderna. When I speak with an accent, I lead a company that is an American success story. After losing money for 10 years, Moderna created a vaccine that helped end the pandemic. We were able to move quickly because of a decade of private investment in our mRNA platform and because of a decision in 2016 to build a manufacturing plant in Massachusetts. We made these investments before most people had heard of mRNA. Over Christmas break 2019, I read about an outbreak of pneumonia-like illness in Wuhan, China. I immediately reached out to the US government because I believed our mRNA technology could make a difference. Two days after Chinese scientists put the genetic sequence online, our team created mRNA 1273, or COVID vaccine. As the world shut down in March, we moved faster. Every day brought new pressure as case counts and deaths rose in the country and around the world. I am so grateful for our teams who worked relentlessly, including Saturdays and Sundays, locked down from home and from our lab and our factory. In the spring of 2020, we worked through Operation Warp Speed to develop a vaccine faster than we could have done alone. The US government gave us and four other vaccine companies funding to accelerate clinical trials. We thank our partners in the federal government for their support. We built our mRNA platform before the pandemic with $3.8 billion of private investment. In May 2020, we raised an additional $1.3 billion from shareholders for manufacturing scale-up for the pandemic. In November, 
I received long-awaited news. The result of our phase three study showed that our vaccine was 94% effective at preventing COVID. I literally cried tears of joy and relief. We had accomplished in 10 months what would normally take 10 years. After a decade of building our mRNA platform, we had changed the future of medicine. Vaccine brought relief in a hospital system, put children and teachers back in classrooms, reopened our economy, and made it safe to reconnect in person. We're under no obligation to do so, but recognizing the US government's investment, our company decided to provide the government a discount versus the over mRNA vaccine. While the government provided $1.7 billion in grant funding, Moderna returned $2.9 billion. The US vaccination program is responsible for an estimated $5 trillion economic value, prevention of 18 million hospitalization in this country, and 3 million American lives saved. Innovations like our vaccine can only happen in America. The public-private partnership of Operation Bar Speed enabled a world-leading response to a crippling pandemic. We at Moderna, along with the people of this country and the people of the world, owe the US government a debt of gratitude. Let me now address the transition from pandemic to endemic. First, can get one at a location convenient to them. With this role comes increased complexity and increased risk. In the pandemic market, we had one customer, the US government. In the endemic market, we're gonna have 10,000 customers. In the pandemic market, the US government took the risk for wasted doses. In the endemic market, Moderna will take that risk and that cost. In the pandemic market, we only had to deliver to three CDC warehouses. In the endemic market, we're gonna to have to manage logistics to deliver to 60,000 pharmacies, doctor's office, and hospital. In the pandemic market, we had one vial with 10 doses in there. In the endemic market, what the market requires is single dose vial, or even better, pre-filled syringe. On top of all this, we're expecting a 90%, 9-0, reduction in demand. As you can see, we're losing economies of scale. We must deal with supply chain complexity, and we must assume the wastage risk and cost that the US government used to assume. So what's next for Moderna? This year, we're investing $4.5 billion in R&D. We are working hard on developing medicines to treat cancer, cystic fibrosis, multiple sclerosis, and very other important diseases. Thank you for the opportunity to share our story and our perspective. Well, Mr. Bentel, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, you sent us a, uh, I think it's a nine-page, single-space document, longer than your testimony. We appreciate that. But in these nine pages, as I read it, you did not mention the National Institute of Health, the NIH, once, nor the research that they did. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, according to a letter I recently received from the NIH, distributed to all members, uh, what the NIH says is that three scientists at the NIH, quote, are co inventors and were integral members of a collaborative team of scientists working to design and produce it. That's the scientists at the NIH, not to mention the many billions of dollars of federal government that came to Moderna in order to produce the vaccine and do the clinical trials. How come, in, in, in your judgment, what role did the NIH play in co-authoring and developing this vaccine? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me start by saying that we have a lot of respect, great respect for the NIH team, and we believe what the NIH does for this country and for the world is really important to advance science that industry might not fund. What happened when the sequence came online is our team at Moderna were working on 
the technology. The way one needs to think about Moderna is like an operating system. What we spent 10 years doing is developing all the tools to make products. All right, I don't mean to be rude, but I isn't it absolutely true that the NIH was also doing that, had done research for many years on that same area? So what is correct, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that the NIH has worked on the virus and on the protein. So what our team did is develop the mRNA molecule. What the NIH did, which was a great confirmation, is they designed the same protein that our team did in, in parallel. But the design of the mRNA vaccine was done by our team. This is our technology. The NIH considers themselves to be co-authors of the vaccine. Do you disagree? So our team have been working through that discussion for quite a while. We have agreed to disagree. The team is following US IP law, which is very important. And what we've done to close the matter is we actually have decided to abandon that patent. We have abandoned that patent. The NIH is aware of it. And we are moving on uh, because we cannot agree on what happened. The mRNA molecule was designed by the Moderna team. That is our technology. Uh, Mr. Mansell, um, in terms of the role that the U.S. government and taxpayers of this country had uh, in terms of, of the success of Moderna, uh, let me read to you a quote from Boston Magazine, June 4th, 2020. And the quote says, quote, the U.S. government announced it was funding Moderna with nearly half a billion dollars. The news sent Moderna's stock price so high that Bansell became a billionaire overnight. End of quote. Comment? So what the government has done through Operation Varspeed was a moment that can only happen in America. We were facing a, a virus. This was the common enemy. This didn't come out of Europe or over governments. What the US government did to say, we need to fund six different companies, six different technologies to be able to get at least one or two vaccines working. That but, was, was really the government Forgive did. me, I don't mean to interrupt you. I just don't have a lot of time. Everybody else is gonna to wanna to ask the question, but here's the point. It was announced that the federal government put money into Moderna. You became, the stock boxes soared. You became a multi-billionaire overnight. So it's hard for me not to believe that the federal government played a major role in the development of this drug. But here is the main point. I don't wanna talk about what happened three years ago. We're here today. You're a multi-billionaire. Other people, top executives on your company are multi-billionaires, all developed as a result of the vaccine. And now we have a situation where you are proposing to quadruple the price of the new, of the vaccine once the government stockpile runs out. That will mean that not only, and we'll talk about later on the patient assistance program, but in terms of government, in terms of Medicare, Medicaid, other government agencies, taxpayers are gonna to have to spend substantially more money. My question to you is given the fact that you have made billions of dollars, that your company has made huge profits, on behalf of the taxpayers of this country, will you reconsider your decision to quadruple the price of the vaccine? So Chairman Sanders, what we have to do is to deal with the complexity I described, and I'm happy to go into more detail for this hearing. This is not the same product. We used to have 10 doses in each vial. Now we're gonna have every vial will have a different dose. This is not the same I product. understand it, but quadrupling the price is huge, and I will hope, I would hope very much that you will reconsider that decision. It's gonna cost the taxpayers of this country billions of dollars. Is that something you can do? The volume we had during the pandemic gave us economies of scale we won't have anymore. That is what is different. Okay, uh, Senator Cassidy. I defer to Senator Paul. Mr. Bansell, uh, Moderna recently paid NIH $400 million. Do you believe it creates a conflict of interest for the government employees who are making money now off of the vaccine to also be dictating the policy about how many times we have to take the vaccine? Good morning, Senator. Uh, indeed, we recently made, a, before Christmas last year, a $400 million payment to the NIH for a, an old patent that they had developed, not related to COVID, but useful in the development of a COVID vaccine uh, to, to prevent for their work. 
Uh, it's for the U.S. government to assess how that money should be Do you think it creates a conflict of interest for the same people deciding the policy of how often we have to take the vaccine to also be making money the more times we take the vaccine? Yes or no? This is for the government to decide. Senator. You have no opinion on whether or not it creates a conflict of interest. Is there a higher interest or a higher incidence of myocarditis among adolescent males 16 to 24 after taking your vaccine? So thank you for the question, Senator. First, let me say we care deeply about safety and we're working closely to, with the CDC and the FDA to Pretty get- Pretty much a yes or no. Is there a higher incidence of myocarditis among boys 16 to 24 after they take your vaccine? The data I've shown actually, I've seen, sorry, from the CDC actually shown that there's less uh, myocarditis for people who get the vaccine versus who get COVID infection. You're, you're saying that for ages 16 to 24 among males who take the COVID vaccine, their risk of myocarditis is less than people who get the disease. That is my understanding. That so is not true. And I'd like to enter into the record six peer reviewed papers from the Journal of Vaccine, the Annals of Medicine that say the complete opposite of what you say. I also spoke with your president just last week and he readily acknowledged in private that yes, there is an increased risk of myocarditis. The fact that you can't say it in public is quite disturbing. Do you think it's scientifically sound to mandate three vaccines for adolescent boys? This is for the public health leaders to decide, Senator. You've been advocating for it. You've been interviewed, and you've been advocating for boosters. Do you know when the myocarditis is most common among these adolescent boys after the second dose? When I spoke with your president, he readily acknowledged in private, yeah, that maybe there ought to be a discussion whether we ought to have one vaccine versus two versus three. If 90% of the myocarditis comes after the second dose, why don't we have a rational discussion about one? Marty McCary, a physician from Johns Hopkins, has said exactly the same thing. It's been discussed, and yet we have this ridiculous notion from the CDC. So the CDC says, and I'll ask you this question. Let's start it as a question. Your 16-year-old's had COVID. Your 16-year-old gets better and now has recovered from COVID. You vaccinate them, and they get myocarditis. Are you going to give them two more vaccines? Your child, give them two more vaccines? I'm not a clinician. I will have to discuss. You have children. I do. Have you vaccinated your children? I have. How many times? Three or four times. Three or four times. We so the this. CDC recommends this, and you know, you're obviously someone who's self-interested in the outcome here. But the CDC says that if your 15, 16-year-old gets COVID, recovers, takes a vaccine, and gets myocarditis, is hospitalized with elevated heart enzymes, and is very sick, the CDC says as soon as he gets better, vaccinate him again. You know how many American parents think that that's a rational, reasonable thing to do? Do you know how many countries don't do this for children? Uh, Sweden doesn't offer the vaccine for kids under 12 unless they're at risk for severe disease. And I agree with that. I'm not saying never on any of this. I think it's a very reasonable position to say kids at risk or have some diseases that there may be a reason for vaccinating some children. Finland doesn't recommend it for under 12 months. Norway also. England as well. France, Poland, Germany, Switzerland, and all vaccinate 12 and up. So we got half the world who have looked at these studies. There's a study in Israel of thousands of patients, and yet you sit here and act as if you've never heard of myocarditis, and you don't think it's an increased risk for young adolescent males, when all of the studies who isolate out people by age have found that, yes, there's an increased risk after taking your vaccine. Pfizer, too, but worse with Moderna. There's an increased risk, Senator. I was comparing it to somebody who gets COVID. Well, that's also not true either. But there's an increased risk of getting it. But even when they compare it to the disease, there are many papers out there who do, that do show that there's more of a risk of myocarditis after vaccination. So you have to weigh the risk and balances. And you are right. You're going to make less money because you're going to try. And they're already trying. The CDC's got it on their schedule. They're going to try to force all the kids in America to do this through school. But guess what? Parents aren't going to do it. They've seen that COVID is not deadly in children, and you're right. It's become less deadly over time. Your market's going down, so you aren't going to make as much money. I'm all for you making money in an honest way, but I don't like the idea that the people making the decisions in government are also receiving money and are now conflicted in their interest. Thank you, Senator Paul. Senator Casey. Mr. Chairman, thanks very much, Mr. Bensell. Great to be with you, and thanks for your testimony. I wanted to... <clears throat> to get right to the heart of the matter that we're exploring today, among other issues, and that's the question of price. 
But I wanted to start with a, by way of a predicate that, that we're certainly grateful for the work of Moderna and the other companies working in concert with the federal government, both federal appropriations as well as agencies like NIH and others to develop these vaccines in short order and to be able to provide the benefit, as you outlined in your testimony, to save millions of lives. And we're grateful for that. We're also grateful for the ongoing work that, that is done every day to, to save lives. I wanted to um, explore, though, this question of this partnership between not only Moder Moderna but other um, entities and the federal government. You might call it a public-private partnership. I would argue that that partnership, which yielded such great benefits for our country and the world, should not be extinguished because the pandemic is over. Uh, I would argue there are ongoing uh, obligations and I think even practical reasons to continue uh, that kind of partnership, maybe in a different form, maybe with different outcomes and different dynamics, if you, as you've outlined on page nine of your testimony when you go from um, the, the ver earlier version of a partnership to commercial uh, application of, of, um, of the vaccine. But I'd ask you this, and I, I noted in your testimony on page one, you said in the second paragraph about um, the Jesuit teachings. I went to a Jesuit high school and college, so I'm somewhat familiar with these, these teachings. You said, quote, Jesuit values, the continuous pursuit of excellence, service of the greater good, number two, and, f and third, social responsibility, you say have informed my life and leadership of Moderna, unquote. So I want to juxtapose uh, those values, which I think are, are commendable, and I, I, I think they're, we hope they're American values as well, uh, next to this, what I would argue is an ongoing obligation to have this partnership. Shouldn't there be a, a, an ongoing obligation with regard to a product that was developed in partnership with the, the federal government to ensure that it remains both inexpensive and accessible. Don't you believe that that is your obligation and Moderna's obligation? Thank you, Senator, and good morning. So first, thank you for the kind words that you shared about our teams and all the other companies and the government uh, personnel who has helped fight this pandemic. So first on access, uh, as I shared in my testimony and in the written one, we care deeply about access and we're working hard with our team and I'm happy to spend more time on that topic. I know it's important for the chairman as well to make sure that people that are uninsured or underinsured have access to a vaccine. We want to make sure that cost and, and out of pocket cash is not a barrier to access to vaccine. Then on the topic of, of price, uh, it's important as we move into the endemic market that we price to value of a vaccine. What value does it bring in terms of healthcare uh, dollars? As you know, vaccines are one of the best investments we can make with healthcare dollars in terms of a return. This has been documented for many, many years because it's better to prevent disease than to have to pay the cost of somebody being hospitalized uh, and that's very expensive cost without even adding the economic burden, obviously. So that's really important. If you look at the interesting comparator is flu. The CVS price of a high-dose flu vaccine used for the elderly is around $95 in this country. If you look at COVID, there are two to three times more hospitalization right now of COVID. So when you look at the price in that range, it seems to make sense versus the value that have been assigned already to flu over the years. And you can look at other vaccine like pneumonia. The, 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 the CVS price of a pneumonia vaccine is around $250. Well, I'd, I'd ask you this, just by way of follow-up, and I realize that you're, you're making that comparison with, with flu vaccine, but... For a lot of my constituents, most of my constituents, no matter what their insurance status is, uh, the cost of prescription drugs is like a bag of rocks on their shoulder every single day. Mm -hmm. And what may not seem like a lot of money to you or a lot of other people, $130, $150, or whatever the number ends up, uh, is a lot of money. And I'd ask you, and I'll, I'll ask you for the, the record in, in, in writing, to ensure that anyone can get a vaccine they won't have to apply through some tedious process and, and then wait for approval and, or apply for some kind of reimbursement have, or have to drive a, a long distance. That, I believe, is your obligation as a company. And I know I'm out of time, but we'll ask that in, in writing. Thank you. 
Uh, you can answer that, uh, Mr. Mansell, if you'd like. Yes, and I'm happy to spend time later on, on the topic on the access program. We want to make sure we have a simple program that is in multi-language. We're also trying to learn from what is not working from current programs done by larger companies. So for example, we want to make sure we can partner with rural community hospital, potentially homeless shelters, to make it much easier. So I'm happy to spend more time on that topic. It's Thank very you. important. Senator Cassidy. Yes, I will allow Senator Romney to go next. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I am one of those um, uh, Americans who's concerned about the fact that Americans tend to pay a lot more for drugs than do people in other countries, uh, and have looked for ways to see if we couldn't uh, have some kind of uh, global um, uh, recognition of the prices that are available in other countries and limiting our, our drug prices to those that may uh, be consistent with a basket of other countries that purchase and honor our, uh, our patents. Um, that being said, um, I, I, uh, I, I reject the idea of, a, if you will, an ex post facto effort on the part of some to say, oh, uh, we, we provided some money in research, a lot of money in research to Moderna, and therefore we want to take the ownership of this product. Uh, that, that would simply uh, be unfair and contrary to our, uh, our system of, of law. Um, I would also note that the U.S. investment in Moderna's uh, effort, uh, I, I would comprise a portion that went to research and, and, and fast-tracking the, uh, the vaccine versus actually purchasing vaccine that was being manufactured by Moderna. Uh, the latter was the great bulk of what the United States government invested, if you will, uh, and actually the wrong word is invested. We purchased a lot of product from Moderna. Glad we did. Um, I'd also note this, which is this is a, a, a global uh, uh, demonstration the world can look at as to the comparison between socialism and capitalism. Free enterprise created vaccines that saved millions of lives. And, and the history of Moderna, I think, is pretty interesting. Uh, you indicated the company started 10 years before COVID, 10 years. It had no products during that time, no, no revenues at all. The investment you said, if I got it right, was $3.8 billion. So that meant individuals responsible for investing money put $3.8 billion into a new technology that might or might not work. I recall uh, understanding that at one point you indicated to your family that you thought there was a 5% chance it would work, yeah. that this technology would work. So if I'm an investor putting $3.8 billion in an enterprise that has a 5% chance of working, I got to expect that if it does work, I'm going to make an awful lot of money. Now, I've heard people say, well, that's corporate greed. Yeah, that's kind of how the free enterprise system works, which is people who start enterprises say, I'm going to take a huge risk, invest my life savings, my career, and if it works, I get a huge return. If it doesn't, I lose it all. There are right now in our country hundreds of startup businesses with trying to develop drugs that will cure diseases. I happen to know that because I invested in some in my prior life. I lost my money in every single one. Studied them as well as we could, we lost our money. That's the nature of it. But we thought if it works, we're gonna really get a huge return for ourselves and for our investors. So you know, I don't know how much money is the right amount of money, but the idea that somehow corporate greed has just been invented in America is absurd. It's been there for the beginning of free enterprise. Individuals investing, hoping that if it succeeds, they'll do very well financially, extraordinarily well. So I want to applaud the example we have. By the way, the socialist countries, China and Russia and, and Northern Europe, did they come up with a vaccine that, that, that saved lives? No, no, they didn't. Uh, Pfizer got uh, technology from a German company, free enterprise company, Moderna, and saved lives. It is a stark demonstration of the comparison between free enterprise and socialism, and free enterprise works, and socialism doesn't when it comes to saving our lives. Now, um, I, I, uh, I, I look at the technology which you're uh, proposing to continue to develop in, in other areas, and I guess I, I want to ask, um, what are the kinds of things that you're working on now? What are the prospects that you believe for some of these to, to make a real difference in saving lives or improving lives? Is this a one-off technology? Uh, mRNA, is this something which is really just effective for vaccines or does it have broader application? And, and what will you do with the, with the money that the company is making? By the way, I, I noted that you're a billionaire now. 
Did, did the company pay you a salary of billions of dollars? Uh, no, no, it's not at all. Uh, you're a billionaire because the stock that you got when you started the company, you kept some of it, I presume. Mm -hmm. That stock is now worth a lot of money because your technology has been proven to actually work. Is it going to work beyond vaccines? And what kinds of things are you working on? So thank you, Senator. So we're very excited because this is a platform that we've worked on for 10 years. Uh, we shared just before Christmas exciting data in cancer, which we are very excited because, of course, all of us have been touched or are being touched right now by cancer. And we show 44% reduction in recurrence of disease for melanoma cancer or deaths. Uh, we are working very quickly to get this with the FDA in a phase three study this year. Uh, we're also working with our partners at Merck to try this into the lung. And we're going to want to explore as many tumor types as we can to see where can we help people. Because if, we, if that result translates to other tumor type, which we believe should happen, we have to be careful and, of course, wait for the clinical data. That could help a lot of people. We're also working on rare genetic disease. One of the reasons I got excited about Moderna in the early days is, you know, I have children. And, I, I'm and sorry. Uh, uh, Senator Romney's speech on socialism took up the bulk of the time. Uh, we have to go to Senator Murray right now. As did, as did our chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Mr. Bonsell, welcome to the committee. Um, you know, I, I understand that shifting from a single federal contract to a multi-layered payer market is adding complexity to your distribution claims. But we are talking about a vaccine that taxpayers invested $12 billion in, a vaccine that was once $15, and now you're planning, of course, to price it at $130, despite the fact that it just costs about $3 to make. And that, as we know, that cost is going to get passed on to consumers, whether it's through higher premiums or higher administration fees. So I, I want to know, what is your answer to this committee and really to the public about the need for such a drastic quadrupling of the cost? Thank you, Senator, for, for the question. So first, just to precise some numbers, the US government invested $1.7 billion in the vaccine development. The, the rest of the amount that you mentioned was actually purchase of product, not investment in, in the development. Uh, as, as I said in my oral testimony, we decided, and this was discussed at our board, this was not asked of us by the government. We, in the letter I wrote to the government when we started discussing about procuring the vaccine in September of 2020, we proposed the discount. It was not asked of us. We discussed with our board and we said, if a vaccine work in September 2020, we had no idea. The phase three came in November, the data. We said, if a vaccine work, we think it's our responsibility to return the capital to taxpayers. And we return, as I mentioned, $2.9 billion in discount versus the over mRNA vaccine that the government procured. So despite our vaccine having three times more mRNA in it, 100 microgram versus the other one was 30 microgram, we discounted our product to return $2.9 billion to the U.S. taxpayer. We thought that was the right thing to do, to say thank you for the government. In addition, the government got $5 trillion of economic value, 18 million hospitalization less, the impact on humans and the cost of it, and 3 million lives saved. So in the endemic setting, the challenge that we have is, as I mentioned in my opening testimony, the waste stage, we're going to have to take care of. So first, we have to make more product than we think we will sell because we cannot have patients going to pharmacies and having no supply. And this is a very hard business, very complex, because it's a seasonal product. The FDA currently plans to tell us, they think, late May, early June, what they want in a vial. We're going to spend the whole summer making as much as we can. And what we know is the forecast is going to be wrong. The forecasts are always wrong. And so the question, to protect people, we need to make more than we think is going to be needed. That waste, we're going to have to, to pay for it. What happened in the fall of 2022, which I think is an important way to think about it, the US government purchased 160 million doses. To the last number I got from CDC, around 50 million doses got in arms. But the government bought everything. So the difference, 110 million doses might go to waste in the garbage. So saying that the cost of a vaccine before was $20, I don't think is the right way to do the cost. It's not the cost to the US taxpayer. The US taxpayer paid for everything. If you do the math, it's around $80. The cost in the fall of 22, still with five products in a vial. 
Okay, well, I, I understand that, and I, I just have a minute here left. I want to ask a couple questions. You oh. are talking about uh, um, get, having a vaccine accessible to the uninsured. What I'm concerned about is people here, $130, and they just don't get it because they think it's expensive. How are you going to make sure people know that you do have this program to help uninsured? So thank you for the question. And, and again, I care deeply about access and, and protecting people. That's why we said the company is, is to help protect people. We will advertise it and communicate about it uh, as we get into the fall. As you know, as of today, the government is still in charge of vaccine distribution. So we, we don't want to confuse things for, for the US consumer. But as we get closer to the fall, we'll make sure we get the, the word out. As I mentioned, we want to work with rural hospitals, community hospitals, homeless shelters, because I really believe there is a better way to give access to people that are uninsured. We have heard loud and clear that the system set up by big companies is too complicated. Too much paperwork takes too much time. Okay, I, I just want a commitment that you are going to make sure the public understands that there is a way to get this if you're uninsured, correct? Senator, we're going to work really hard to make sure that the public understands the process. Okay. Um, and my final question really is about the COVID-19 vaccine, tr vaccine trials that excluded pregnant populations, which left moms and their doctors with very little information to guide them. It caused a lot of confusion. And we know that pregnant patients uh -oh. with COVID are at greater risk um, if, if they're infected. Uh, the, last week, actually, the CDC released some new data showing that 40% increase in maternal deaths compared with 2020, and a recent GAO report found that COVID-19-related deaths accounted for this increase. Can you just talk to us about your decision to exclude pregnant patients from trials? Yes. Thank you, Senator. That's a very important question that I care deeply about, you know, having got children. Uh, the challenge we had in 2020 under guidelines from the FDA is to be very careful, which you understand in clinical trial, the safety of a participant is <coughs> our number one priority. There was a lot we didn't know about the safety of a vaccine until November of 2020. It's like for the pediatric setting, we did those studies much later, which was hurting, you know, parents having the ability to have a vaccine for their children because we wanted with the FDA to go slow to understand the safety. I'm getting gaveled. I'm Can sorry. you just tell me that you will include a pregnant patient <coughs> in your continuing trials? Yes, and that's all. We want to include pregnant women and also the pediatric for the children. Senator Cassidy. I'll defer to Senator Tuberville. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Uh, Chairman, Mr. Benzel, thank you for being here today. Thank you for what you did for my state of Alabama, our country, and the world and to your employees. Sometimes we overlook, you know, the people that actually do the, the big work. But thanks for being here today and answering these questions. I hope my Alabama accent and your French accent can get along here pretty well. Uh, we I'm sure they will. Yeah. You know, I understand that Moderna was founded in 2010 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you have been the CEO since October 2011, and I also understand that you are from France originally. Could you speak to why Moderna was founded in the U.S. instead of somewhere else in the EU? That's a great question, Senator. Uh, there's no better country than this country for science and entrepreneurship. Uh, people are willing to take risk. There's, as Senator Romney mentioned, much more capital and it's available to take risk. Um, it started in the U.S. because the core technology was initially from Harvard Labs and MIT Labs, like you've seen a lot of those stories. Uh, a great VC firm from Boston who only does healthcare work. Very innovative, very risky type of work, but that could change the world. And that's the reason I decided to, to join the team that was being formed to start this, this enterprise. You need to know, when I was talked about the idea of using mRNA to treat people, I first look at them and say, are you kidding me? This will never work. But the more I spent time thinking about it, looking at the data, talking to experts, uh, as Senator Romney said, uh, I had to tell my wife it was a 5% chance of working. She's not a scientist, and she was asking, how risky is it? But because if it was going to work, it was going to be a new platform. It was going to be a new way to make medicine. And that's why I took that risk with my career, is to say, it might fail. I will have to find another job. It's going to be OK. But I have to try to make this work because it could save so many people. Of course, we never thought there would be a pandemic in our lifetime. But we're working on you know, infectious disease vaccine. We have around 13 clinical trials right now, which is one of the largest number in the industry. As I mentioned, we're working on cancer, genetic disease, 
heart disease. The team is working on autoimmune disease. It's still in a lab, but coming soon. This is a really, it's a platform. For 100 plus years, the pharma industry has been an analog industry where every drug is different. We have to rely on everything. This is a platform that's going to enable so many medicine helping people. And as we saw during the pandemic, because it's a platform, we can go much faster to the clinic, much faster to approval, so we can help save lives. Thank you. Uh, kind of reminds me of my former profession, which was a coach. And I used to tell my players, this country owes you nothing but an opportunity. And you came here, took the opportunity, and made a success out of it. So I want to thank you for that. And, and again, a lot of people want to thank you for that. We're hearing a lot today about how much the government spent on vaccine development and how much risk pharmaceutical companies took themselves. I wasn't here in the Senate when Operation Warp Speed was getting started, but I do recall hearing a lot of criticism on the other side of the aisle about whether partnering with pharmaceutical companies like this was a good idea and whether we would get any successful vaccines. It seems like it worked out pretty well for all of us. Can you speak uh, about Operation Warp Speed and how it brought the vaccines to patients and what the overall impact of our healthcare system and overall deaths would have been without this investment? Thank you, Senator. I think the world owes so much gratitude to the US government and to Operation Warp Speed. I think the idea to say, we have no idea which technology is gonna work. We're fighting this enemy, the virus, but we don't know which technology is gonna work. So let's bet on three technologies. Protein technology, very mature, but much slower. Adenovirus technology and mRNA technology. And to do it even better, the government said, let's not bet on one company. Let's bet on two companies per technology versus the six company portfolio to run the portfolio to edge the risk. And then Congress, and I want to really thank members of Congress for the budget that was appropriated to BARDA to be able to fund this work, allowed this. This yeah. did not happen in Europe. This did not happen in Asia or anywhere else. This country helped change the course of this pandemic through the public-private partnership, which is why when the government called for help, we raised our hand. We made a 10 years worth of investment in science and technology platform available. So we're going to make the technology available. We make the plant available. We will delay products. We have commercial products, including, for example, in cancer, that have been delayed because we prioritize our resources to the pandemic because it was the right thing to do for the country. Thank you. And I'd just like to make this statement. We did a lot of research on this. And the U.S. taxpayer paid $30 billion for the successful vaccines and received $1.15 trillion in direct benefits back from that $38 billion. Pretty good investment to me. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Mensel, for being with us today. So I want to start by just saying that the COVID-19 vaccine is safe and effective in preventing hospitalizations and death from COVID-19, and the process for developing and distributing this vaccine is a tribute to the innovation and the technology and the perseverance of the scientists and researchers and manufacturers and also the federal, state, tribal, and local agencies that delivered shots into arms. And I include Moderna in that group. I mean, it's also critical that Americans continue to have access to these vaccines. Now, um, we're not talking economic theory today, but I want to say I'm a capitalist. Um, I went to business school. I started my own business, though I did not make as much money as you've made, Mr. Mansell. Um, and I understand the concepts of return on investment and risk reward, but it is difficult for me to accept that the profits that you are reaping on the backs of American taxpayers are necessary or reasonable. It feels like a bonanza to me. So I want to just understand a little bit about what's going to happen next. Um, you tell us that you expect the Moderna, expect Moderna to offer its vaccine at a list price of about $130, up from $26.23. Yet it is extremely confusing for Americans to understand what the price is that they will actually pay. It feels a little bit like a lottery, and too often we lose rather than win. So if a Minnesotan gets their insurance through Medicare, their vaccine will be free thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act. Will Moderna negotiate with Medicare on the price, or will you demand $130, sort of take it or leave it? So good morning. Thank you, Senator, for the question. So indeed, and maybe I should start there. Regardless of insurability status of people in this country, where you're insured by a company, insured through a government program, right. or you're uninsured, we want that this is a no out-of-pocket cost for the American people. 
that is really, really important to us, which is why, as I shared, we really set up that program for the uninsured, for the people that are insured just through the law, because it's a vaccine, there'll be no copay. Mm -hmm. And we'll make sure for the summer that the American people are aware, if they are insured or uninsured, right. th there will be no copay. But they can walk. I'm sorry, but somebody will be paying. And what I'm trying to understand with Medicare or Indian Health or Veterans, um, the Veterans Administration, will you negotiate with the federal government and those agencies beyond $130, or is that the price, sort of take it or leave it? So like it's usually traditional in the industry, our teams and those discussions are happening as we speak, we'll be discussing with all those agencies. Okay. Following the, the, so that the law you will be negotiating. and the process, yes. And then... Thanks to um, the Affordable Care Act, Americans who receive their health insurance uh, through private insurance or through the exchanges will also get a vaccine for free. Um, do you expect that you'll be negotiating with those insurance companies or the PBMs or others on the ultimate price? Because again, even though it's free to, it might be free to those folks based on their insurance, somebody's gonna pay and that could of course contribute to increased rates for everybody. That's a very important question, Senator. So first, one piece that's important about the vaccine is if you look at the vaccine uh, in that price range, and that's why we, 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 we looked at it very carefully, the cost savings in terms of hospitalization cost that year for people who will not get the vaccine and end up in hospital is a tremendous return. The, the cost is estimated to be in several hundreds of dollars for the direct cost of hospitalization and medical cost, not even talking economic impact and things like that. Uh, and so the... The, the benefit to healthcare system is going to be in reduction of healthcare spend in hospitals. Yes, that's I, I of course understand that. The uh, the question though is still whether or not there's. I'm hearing you say that you expect to be negotiating on what the ultimate price is, um, and. Uh, I want to just note, Mr. Chair, that thanks to the Affordable Care Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, um, Americans will be not paying a cost for this, but there still is a cost to the system, to taxpayers. Now, let me ask you one last question, just the minute I have left. So um, if I'm uninsured and I go to my local pharmacy and I, um, need, I want to get the vaccine, I hear you saying that you don't have all the details worked out yet on what that will be like, but what would you like that to be like for that American? I mean, they're going to be asked to you know, pay something up front and then try to figure out the paperwork for a reimbursement later, for example. So thank you for the question, Senator. We want to make it as easy as possible. What will be really bad... I think we can agree on this point. If somebody walks into a pharmacy and decides they don't want the vaccine, we, we want those people who want to be vaccinated to have access to a vaccine. So we're really trying to work with the teams on all the learnings of the other programs that sometimes don't work so well, which is why I'm a big proponent with our teams that are having those discussions as we speak to think about those people, what are they associated to? Is it a rural community hospital? Uh, and yeah. then is there a way for Moderna to do a partnership with a hospital so that people will go to that hospital, if the hospital is certified they are uninsured, those individuals don't have to do the paperwork. So we're trying to work on things like this because we want people who want to be vaccinated to get access to vaccine. We care deeply about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Thank you. Point of privilege, if I might. Do I understand in response to Senator Smith that you are, in fact, prepared to negotiate that $130 price? with Medicare, Medicaid, and other federal agencies. So, Senator, our teams are going and having discussions with all the different customers. As I said, we used to have one customer, the U.S. government. We have 10,000 now. So our teams are, as we But you speak, have a federal government, which is basically one. Are you prepared to negotiate that price with the federal government? There are different agencies that work differently, so we're working with all of those. Senator Cassidy. Mm -hmm. And I will defer to Senator Braun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member. This is um, indicative of a much bigger problem facing health care. You're one small part of it, which looms huge because everyone sooner or later ends up with a prescription, even a vaccination now and then. The issue that most of us are confronted with, if you don't own a health care business, is that, I listen carefully to Senator Sanders, uh, Sanders' opening remarks, you can probably take those as being representative of anyone that wrestles with the health care system that does not own a business in the system. It's gotten to be such a huge part of our GDP, uh, unlike anywhere else in the world, 
You get into something extra normal like we've just gone through, it raises all kinds of issues. And I've been the senator most outspoken on, I think you run like an unregulated utility across the board. You don't embrace competition. You don't embrace transparency. And you're a small part of it. Hospitals now have gotten up to where they're close to 35 to 40 percent of the health care dollar. And that is even harder to find out how much things cost, how it's working. If you're in the business of free enterprise, which I think many on our size make excuses for it, that means no barriers to entry. That means full transparency, full competition, and don't try to business with the federal government and then want more from it when you're not performing well in the first place. Let's look at a narrow issue here. You're claiming that you need more because of the cost of distribution. Well, in any other field, I did it for 37 years, it's very simple. You have a network of distributors, dealers. You don't have PBMs in there that make it confusing. You need an MBA to look at that flow chart. When are you going to start making it easy for all of us to see what things cost and then not look to government when they were part of this formulation in terms of how we got the vaccination and then want more from it. You're involved in a taxpayer. Uh, uh, you're in, involved in a lawsuit where you've got two smaller companies, Arbitus and Genovant, that are making a claim that you had a patent infringement. I'm hearing that not only here, but patent tweaking patent infringements when it comes to where we spend even more money on biologics and biosimilars. Point being, whether it's a government paying for it or the private sector, it's a broken system and you need to get better at it or you're going to get solutions in the long run that you don't like. Your distribution system, why is it something that you sound like you got to recreate it? Where has it been up to this point? How do you distribute your flu vaccines? Why do you need this much money? A 400% price increase is preposterous, especially when you've been given all this government largesse, and it's even going to protect you from these lawsuits. What's the nature of your current distribution system to where you can't just put this into it, and why is this that much different from what you've done for years in distributing a flu vaccine? Because it looks like we're headed more to where this is going to be like the flu than it's going to be something extra normal. Thank you, Senator, for your question. So just to clarify, we do not have a flu vaccine on the market yet. We have one in clinical study. We should have a phase three data soon, and hopefully- You we may not have one on the market, but there's a distribution network for them from your competitors. Why wouldn't you be able to get into that? Why do you have to justify creating a new distribution network? No one would ever do that. So indeed, Senator, we're gonna use, but we have to set up a distribution network. I'm not saying that we're gonna build our own warehouses like other companies do. We're going to work with companies, but we have to set up those contracts. During the pandemic, we only shipped trucks to three warehouses in the U.S. When the CDC was taking the responsibility and the cost of getting the vaccine to hospitals, pharmacies. So Is government requiring you to do something different here that would uh, cause you to use a different network? What, what do McKesson and Cardinal and the others do? There's a network to get this stuff to pharmacies already in the places they need to go. Why can't you blend it into that, keep the cost down? Be a little entrepreneurial on what you're doing. It's part of a solution we're gonna be doing, Senator, is we're gonna use existing networks, but we have to set up everything because we never had a commercial product before. We just have to go, which we are doing right now, for all the contracting, negotiating of all those rights and so on, to set up the distribution capability so that we can get the vaccine to pharmacies. We're about out of time. You cannot, as well as the rest of the industry, including hospitals, have the best of both worlds, where you want government to be in there helping you when it's tough, and where, for the private side, most of us are not happy with the fact that we're lucky if your uh, health insurance plan only goes up 5 to 10%, which incorporates hospitals, pharma, and maybe the Darth Vader of it all, the insurance business. Something's got to give, or you're going to get more government involved in health care. Thank you. Senator Hickenlooper. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Bensell. Thank you for coming in and testifying before us. It really is a remarkable, if you look at the the arc of what happened, and you look at it, actually take it all the way back to when 
Moderna was founded in 2010 and you came on board in 2011, I look at so many moments of risk and how many times, I don't want to alarm anyone, but the, the company could be at risk and your margins were so thin you didn't have sufficient money to invest. Uh, and I think the notion of what the federal government did during a time of crisis where we made, I think, the, 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 a decision uh, baked in wisdom to, to pursue six different solutions. So talk about multiple working hypotheses. Um, and in your case, the, the federal government, uh, BARDA, provided, I think it was $1.7 billion in your statement, you said. Um, and that was money that really was after the earlier investments, which were, which were largely in research. And those are public-private partnerships that have, that money is invested. We do that, the government does that in all different levels. Um, in this case, the $1.7 billion, you actually returned $2.9 billion? $2.9 billion. $2.9 billion. Um, what, what was part of your motivation in that? Thank you, Senator, for the comments and for the question. Uh, it's actually quite simple. As we were starting, so there's really two moments during the pandemic in the partnership with the government. First, focus on the vaccine development and accelerate it. That's what BARDA funding provided. Then we started to discuss with the government toward the end of the summer 2020 about purchasing vaccine in case the FDA would approve them. And as we started to have those discussions, we started to discuss with our board. And it became very clear, like five minute discussion at a board meeting, that we had to find a way to give the money back to the US government because we all felt very grateful that thanks to that funding, we were able to accelerate the vaccine. I believe more than I will have got the vaccine approved without the funding, but it will not have been by the end of the year. So Americans' life will have been impacted by that delay without the support. And so when we looked at it, we were like, if we're gonna get you know, the vaccine to work, we should provide a discount. And the board decided in five minutes, and that's what I put in my letter that I sent to the government in our first discussions for procurement. Well, and I, it'd be an interesting calculation to look at how many lives were saved by accelerating that process with that $1.7 billion that was paid back almost, not quite double, but, but uh, certainly more than just uh, paying it back. And I am sympathetic to some of the issues as you look at pricing, uh, going forward that this is something that has to be kept at a cold temperature. You're going from one customer to thousands of customers. Uh, you're looking at a 90% or 95% reduction in, in what you're producing. So all your manufacturing is gonna to have to be re, yes. reconfigured. Um, you know, and I'm not an expert in pharmaceuticals, so I can't address that, but I think it is a, a complex issue that we need to spend more time looking at. And, and in these kinds of public-private pri partnerships, we want to get to the, the alignment of interests. And, and I, I guess my question is, uh, you can comment on that, but I'd also, what do you think going forward, how can we do a better job of creating these, these public-private partnerships so that both sides feel they know exactly what they're getting and, and, and what's, you know, that there's an alignment of that self-interest? Thank you, Senator. Actually, the way we think about the price during the pandemic was actually a discount. We are talking here today about an increase in price. But if you think about what happens in any other industry, when you get a very large volume, you get a very big discount. Mm -hmm. That's actually what we did. We had 500 million doses order from the US government. This year, if we get 30, 50, that would be great. Actually, this year, if you look at analyst consensus, the company might be at a loss this year. No, I, I, and you made that, I get, and I am sympathetic to that. Um, I'm not sure all the other senators are as sympathetic as I am, but it, it, we'll have to, with discussions. But I do want to get, because I've only got uh, 40 seconds left, and or maybe maybe we'll get an extra 20 seconds. What would be, what would you suggest in terms of going forward in terms of improving public-private partnerships? Thank you, Senator. I think making sure that the terms are clear. As you know, in enterprise, we are making decisions every day. And what we're trying to do is to allocate our resources to the best projects that we can do. And so I think being clear about what are the rules and making sure that the rules don't change later. That's what is really important. You know, when we discuss about the BARDA funding, there was no discussion about commercial pricing. The, the, the focus was accelerate the study, get the vaccine to American people, save lives. And as you said, this was a great return for US taxpayers. Right, no, I, I, again, I think it's, 
you can't measure the success and the, and the savings. I haven't added it up, but to figure out that discount, how much savings that was, and uh, you know the the benefit to the economy you do mention in your you did mention in your remarks, um, it's just, it's just a remarkable story. So anyway, I I feel I feel gratitude uh, that that you were there and able to step up and play such an important role in addressing really the worst medical crisis of certainly my lifetime. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. First, I'm going to pass my ranking member seat right now to uh, Senator Mullins while I walk across and ask in another committee, and then I'll defer to Senator Marshall for questioning. All right. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Thank you, Chairman. I want to, first of all, submit for the record a couple of uh, op-eds. The first one written by a senator from Demo uh, Democrat from Indiana and my hero, Bob Dole from Kansas. This is the, uh, uh, an editorial just talking about the By Dole Law which encourages and has been so successful, encourages federal government to work with the private sector. And also an op-ed that I wrote, goodness, mine was in 2022, about how uh, fixing prices uh, kills innovation. So we'll submit both of those for the record, if it's okay, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Chairman, let the record show that you and I agree on something again. This is my goal. Every one of these hearings is for you and me to agree on something. <laughs> and I agree that, that uh, charging Americans $130 for this vaccine is outrageous. But where we always disagree is the cure. You know, how do, we, how do we get there? And I know one of your biggest concerns is the cost of insulin as it has been. And I presented this graph that shows what the cost of insulin has done as competition is being introduced in the market. And with two biosimilars coming on board now, the cost of, I checked with one of my pharmacies back to home, a month's supply of insulin, $400 six months ago, now a biosimilar for $120. And I'm not satisfied. And I also want to point out, though, this big difference between the, the gross cost, the list price, versus the net cost, and how pharmacy benefit managers work in that margin for their rebates is something we need to tackle yet uh, as well. Okay, let's go to the next uh, graph here, Sh Charlotte. Again, this is what happens in America when we have innovation and competition that um, the U.S. leads the world in access to miracle drugs. And we'll go to this last one as well, just showing how certainly the, the America's paying too much for medicines, but at least we have access to these miracle drugs. And I would ask everybody, which miracle drugs do you want to give up? Which one of these would you give up? Would you give up CAR T cell therapy, the miracle cures we have in cancer? Which ones would we, we give up? So we gotta be careful we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, if you will. Mr. Bonsell, I, you know, you guys have been working on mRNA technology, I think since at least 2010, 2011, and you had a lot of patents you'd issued. Were most of those patents in that era around mRNA uh, development, vaccine development? Good morning, Senator. Thanks for the question. Yes, the company only works on mRNA because we believe if we invest in the platform and improve it, we can do more application of more medicine across therapeutic areas. So it's mRNA focused. Right. You know, I, I bet you expected when you invented this vaccine, you would come to Congress and get a hero's welcome, that you'd get a Nobel Prize even for this. You had no idea that you were going to be uh, castigated be, because... Uh, of, of your success as well. So that's, yeah, that's the two sides of this coin that we're concerned about. I want to back up to your time with your previous company, Biomirex. Yeah, Biomirex. And at that time, the Wuhan laboratory, the BSL-4, Biosecurity Level 4 lab was being made, and your predecessor had something to do with that. Did you keep track of the, of the Wuhan lab being, uh, go, going up, and were you concerned about it? So Senator, Biomario had no involvement with the Wuhan lab. I was aware, of course, because Biomario is the leading company in infectious disease diagnostic. I was aware there was a new uh, high security lab being built in China, but I had zero involvement. My company has zero involvement. Okay. Yeah, this is a, a pretty complex question. Is Moderna or Moderna executives had agreements with organizations in China, including the Wuhan Institute of Virology or with EcoHealth, and if so, what are the terms, and does Moderna own any of those people any monies? So we never had any agreement with Chinese labs or Wuhan labs, Senator. Or no. EcoHealth? I, I'm not aware of that lab. Okay. Were you aware in September 2019 when uh, the Wuhan lab and the Chinese took down their DNA lab bank, were you aware of that pretty much in, in sequence with when that occurred? 
I was not seen at all. Okay. In September 2019 uh, is when, when that occurred. And in December of 2019, you took your jointly owned mRNA coronal vaccine candidates to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, to work with Senator uh, Ralph, or not Senator, Dr. Ralph Barrick uh, as well. Uh, what was the impetus to do that? Thank you for the question, Senator. We're, it was actually a, a vaccine for candidate against MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is of a corona family, but of course not SARS-CoV-2, it's a different one. But you had no idea that what was exploding in China already, probably since September. No, I was made aware for the first time, as I said during my testimony, at the Christmas break, uh, by reading the newspaper, there was a little article saying there was pneumonia-like symptom cases that were weird in Wuhan, which is why I directly contacted the NIH at that time to say, hey, are you aware about this? Because we had been working together on coronavirus, as you mentioned, because we believe that the highest risk of pandemic was- You never worked with China? Never worked with the WIV? At, at Moderna, no, sir. Well, what about not in Moderna? So when I was running Biomer before, we had a team in China. The company was in 40 plus countries. So we were selling product in China, yes, sir. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Senator Baldwin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this week, I'm proud to once again introduce my bipartisan Fair Drug Pricing Act with my colleague, uh, Senator Braun. Uh, this would require drug companies to provide a transparency and justification report when they increase the price of a drug above a certain threshold or when the drug costs more uh, than the median household income. Uh, in the U.S. Today's hearing dis demonstrates exactly why we need more transparency. While big drug companies have uh, taken in record profits, more than one quarter of Americans struggle to pay for their prescription medications. These same Americans are the taxpayers who are footing the bill for research and drug development that companies like uh, Moderna are benefiting from. Researchers have estimated that prior to the pandemic, uh, uh, the federal government and taxpayers invested more than $337 million in mRNA vaccine technology and development. Mr. Bensell, I, I didn't uh, uh, read your mention of those numbers in, in your written testimony. Um, I believe that when drug manufacturers significantly increase the price yeah. of their drugs, that they should have to provide information to the public that justifies these increases, including uh, research and development expenditures derived from federal funds. Uh, my bill, uh, the Fair Drug Pricing Act, also requires that companies provide information on all stock-based performance metrics used to determine executive compensation associated with price increases or high initial launch prices. Mr. Bansell, your stock compensation is, I understand, based on performance metrics set by your board. And uh, last year, uh, it's reported that you earned salary and stock compensation worth nearly $400 million. Uh, this is despite the fact that your board uh, apparently found that you actually underperformed uh, the company's target for sales income generated by the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so I, I want to ask, um, the decision to increase the price of the vaccine is, um, it, it appears tied to the impact um, of your personal performance assessment on your bonus and how much you would stand to gain uh, personally from increasing the price of the COVID vaccine. Um, can you uh, talk about how much of that decision to increase the price um, is related, uh, as, I, as I just suggested? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, it, is, it is not related. 
when we look at price, we look at value for any product. Uh, we look at what's the value of a product to the healthcare system, how much money can be saved, and that's how the price is being determined. And that's why, as I mentioned initially, if you look at the, price, the cost of a flu vaccine at CVS, it's around $95 for a high dose flu vaccine used for the elderly. And given there's two to three times more hospitalization of COVID versus flu, that was one of the metrics we looked at as looking at price. The other one, as you might be aware, the, the, the cost of a pneumonia vaccine is around $230. Uh, so that's kind of how we looked at, at price. Well, it, let, me, let, let me ask another question. Moderna's most recent annual report uh, stated that the company repurchased $3.3 billion worth of stock in 2022 and over uh, $800 million in 2021. Uh, to quote, return capital to shareholders. Uh, Mr. Bensell, uh, you are one of, uh, if not the largest shareholder in Moderna. Yet despite spending significantly to buy back stock over the last two years, uh, Moderna's uh, share price has actually declined. If you had not spent nearly $5 billion on buybacks, um, when your stock was at the highest price it's ever been, uh, do you think you would be under less pressure to raise the price of the COVID vaccine now? Thank you, Senator. So the price is not linked to the company's performance. The price is linked to the value of a product to the patient and to the impact on the patient. That's how we set price. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Oh, uh, Senator Mullen. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> the government overshot the number of vaccines needed in 2022 by over 100 doses. Uh, what were the challenges of estimating the number of doses needed for 2023, and how does that impact your cost? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Th that's one of a very complex issue with this transition from the pandemic to endemic. I have never managed a company going from pandemic to endemic, and it has not happened since, of course, the pandemic flu of 1918. And so we are trying to, to guess uh, how much volume is needed, which is the manufacturing challenge we have, especially as a small company, we do not do the filling in the vials ourselves. We have to contract that to outside companies. And what we're trying to do is to not undershoot it, because as I said earlier, we care deeply about having enough product available for patients when somebody walks into a pharmacy. And so we know by design we're going to have to overmake products and we're going to have to take the returns and, and destroy them at the end of the season. But that's part of the cost of running a seasonal respiratory vaccine franchise, which is why it's necessary for us to increase the cost versus the discount that we had during the pandemic where the government took all the risk, manage the waste. But buying, buying the, the, the um, unused doses, you have to factor factor that back into the cost because you have to repurchase them and then and then dispose of them correctly. Is that correct? So we have to do two things, Senator, you're correct. One is we have to make more than we need mm -hmm. to make sure there's available across the country when needed. So if you think about just the supply chain and distribution, you need much more to make sure you have everywhere at, at any time. And then there's the returns, which is if a pharmacy gets more than they thought they needed, they will return it to us and then we have to, of course, incur that cost, obviously. Uh, what will need to change within your company to accommodate the demand for single vial versus pre-filled syringes rather than 10 dose vials uh, that were purchased by the federal government? So we have to move to single dose vial because that's what the pharmacists and the doctors want. Okay. And we understand that. That's the commercial market needs because it's simpler. There's less wastage. Uh, somebody works but in you the have to you have to factor that into the cost too? Uh, exactly. Is it cheaper to do 10 at a time versus one at a time? It's much more expensive to do 10 because just if you look at the cost of a glass vial, you need 10 vials versus one. Right. And then you use a lot of capacity. In the, I'm talking about per dose, though. Yeah. And then you use a lot of capacity at the manufacturer. So right. while the, the number of doses go down, the number of vials go up. Right. Um, Pfizer is also noted that they're going to intend to increase the price of their vaccine to $130 per dose. How does the market competition factor into changing cost? So we look at value and price, and of course, like in any market, uh, we want to be competitive as an enterprise, and so we look at that as well. But the key driver 
as I was sharing with the senator a minute ago, is really value, which is what's the value of a vaccine in terms of healthcare costs, and then how can we create a product to extract some value for the company, but leave some value in the healthcare system. So we'll, we want to make sure that there's a lot of value left for, for Medicare and all the, the payers. Um, your company decided to take government funding as part of the Operation Warp Speed. Can you discuss how Moderna chose to take the loan from HHS and the difference in business structure between you and other manufacturers? Thank you, Senator. So we decided to take the loan from uh, Barda because it will accelerate the vaccine development. If you go back in time, those discussions were happening in January, end of January, February, March, until April grant. And what other company we wanted to ensure is the vaccine going to clinical trial as fast as possible. At the time, Moderna was losing money. And so if we had developed the vaccine without government funding, the development would have been much slower because we would not have been able to talk some of financial risk that we took thanks to the government money, like making product ahead of a study. And so that's why we decided to take the money because we thought it was going to save lives. Thank you. That I yield back. Um, Mr. Mansell, um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, let me go and then I'll get it to you. I haven't, I haven't asked yet. It'll be your What's second round. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Cassidy. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, um, I'm going to lead into my first question, uh, kind of repeating some of the things I said in my opening statement. Uh, for decades, this committee has passed legislation knowing that we would have to ask companies to step up at perhaps a pandemic time and do exactly what Moderna did during this time. And so others didn't make the same choice as Moderna to collaborate with the government. So the question is, uh, if we send a hostile signal to future and prospective partners that Moderna is now being singled out for its decision to work more closely with the government, what signal would that send to that future prospective partner? Now, related to that, there's folks who have spoken of March in, where the intellectual property which has been developed by Moderna or Pfizer or another would be, if you will, marched in by the federal government and shared worldwide to those who had had no role in its development. What would that do to the willingness of a future prospective partner to work in a public-private partnership with the federal government to find a solution as hastily as it had to be found. Thank you, Senator. So first, let me say, we were very proud to partner with the US government, and when the call came, we raised our hand and we said, of course, we will help and do our best work. I think what is key for any enterprise, not only in the pharmaceutical industry, but across different fields, is to know what is going to happen. Companies need to plan based on what are the hypotheses or how we're going to work together during the crisis and also after the crisis. And so I think what we need as industry is clear rules that do not change. So for example, during the BADA discussions, there were no discussion on commercial price. It was assumed, never discussed, to the best of my knowledge, no, but I have limited time. So the question is, if the government were to exercise its march-in rights and take the IP from the company and distribute it worldwide without compensation for the company, what would that do to, what can you imagine it would do to a, a company, a future company's willingness to work with the federal government in a public-private partnership? I worry, Senator, that it will really impact the willingness of those companies to partner with the government, and I think patients will suffer. Okay. Now, let me ask you, um, in your it's a different question, different set, in your patient assistance program, well, I assume that will also apply to the short-term limited duration programs, because to be clear, under current U.S. law, if you are commercially insured, if you are uh, federally or state insured through Medicaid, Medicare, et cetera, you don't have to pay for this vaccine, at least as the patient. You're paying indirectly through, through premiums, but you're not paying directly. And you're going to make through your patient assistance program available for the uninsured. Two questions about that. Will that also include limited, um, a limited uh, short-term li short -term limited duration policies? Uh, which do not are not under the federal mandate to provide vaccines at no cost. Um, I'm, that's a question. I don't know if you know that. I don't know the answer, but I will make a note to follow up with my team, and I'll make sure we follow up back with you. After. Please, and I would ask that those folks be afforded the same as the uninsured, because effectively for vaccine, they're uninsured. Secondly, as regards the vaccine itself, will your patient assistance program also include the administration fee? 
so this is something we have to look into, sir. I will say for the uninsured, just as a doctor yes. treated the uninsured, yes. it's not just the cost of the vaccine, it is the administration fee. And obviously that's something you can limit. Yeah. You can make it an X amount of dollars. Yeah. It doesn't have to be astronomical. But, we, but I agree with Senator Sanders. We want that PAP to be something that works for patients and is not just kind of like, oh, yeah, we have it, but no one can use it. Um, now, uh, I also want to clarify a couple other things. It was suggested that the IRA is what has resulted in the coverage of the COVID vaccine, but indeed that was the CARES Act, just to make that clear. I also want to make something else clear, that there's been a lot of discussion about pharmaceutical cost, but this has nothing to do with the cost of a drug. A cost of a drug is related to pharmacy benefit managers. It's related to the initial price of the, of the drug. It's related to scarcity, you name it. But that is a separate topic from this. And I look forward, Mr. Chairman, to that future discussion in which we do discuss the high cost of pharmaceuticals. But that is a separate issue from this vaccine. And I think I wanted to make that clear because it was not, you know, perhaps not as clear as it could be. And with that, I yield. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Uh, Senator H Hassan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Cassidy, uh, for this hearing. Mr. Bansell, thank you for being here. I want to follow up a little bit on what Senator Cassidy was just trying to get at. Moderna has said that its patient assistance program will provide low-cost and no-cost COVID-19 vaccines to the uninsured and underinsured. This program cannot simply be a public relations exercise that provides cover for the company to hike prices on families seeking COVID-19 vaccines. So how quickly after the launch of its patient assistance program will Moderna start providing publicly available data on the number of individuals it has covered and typical out-of-pocket costs under the program? Thank you, Senator, for the question. We care deeply about patient access, and so I will work with the team to figure out what is the right frequency for sharing that data. But we want to find ways for people to get access to the vaccine. Yes. We, we still have 250 people dying every day of COVID right. in this country. Yeah. And we have a tool, so we want to make them available. I, and I understand that Congress and the public is going to need information so that as you all proceed, uh, if you are still planning to hike the price, um, that we can make sure that really the uninsured and underinsured are getting meaningful access to this in a timely way. Um, another piece of this is that uninsured individuals seeking COVID-19 vac vaccines are going to need to be able to access this program that you have, and they shouldn't have to fill out pages of forms with fine print in order to get access to your patient assistance program. So how long will the application for your program be, and how much documentation will you require from applicants? Thank you, Senator. We've heard that feedback as we've talked to patients, to doctors, to members of Congress, and so the team is working diligently to figure out how do we use technology to make it simpler, how do we make sure we have access to enough languages, right. so it's easy for people who are not, you know, uh, English as a first, first language. And also we're trying to be creative, as we've done all over the history of a company. For example, are there partnerships we can do directly between Moderna and the rural hospital or community hospital in your state? Yeah. And of course, across the country. Right. Whereas we do a partnership, the doctors agree that they will certify that the people they give a vaccine that will send to them for free yeah. will be uninsured so that individuals don't have to all do the form. So we're trying to figure out all those mechanisms to make it easier for people, including we're also working, for example, with homeless shelters for the same thing. Okay, so um, I think that's really important. I think it's also gonna be important that you all release the application for your patient assistance program before its launch so that the public can see what you're requiring from uninsured families. And just a note on the rural issue, one of the other things to be aware of, of course, is that a lot of rural communities don't have uniform access to high-speed internet, yes. right? So we need to have processes uh, that are meaningful for people who don't have that kind of access. Um, I also just want to talk about the impact of the price increase on vaccine uptake. The fact remains that hiking prices and requiring families to fill out forms will likely decrease vaccine uptake and set back the public health effort to combat COVID-19. What are your plans to quantify and publicly disclose the consequences of your price hike for vaccine uptake among the uninsured and underinsured? 
Thank you, Senator, for the question. So I will work with my team, and we are very happy to follow up with your office in terms of what will be our disclosure moving forward. The plan is still being worked on. What we want to make sure is that the plan is set up and announced way ahead of the vaccine availability in the fall so that somebody who's uninsured has access at the same time right. as somebody who's insured. Well, I, I understand that, but I also think it's going to be really important for us to see what the uptake looks like in light of these increases because I think all of us who have constituents, uh, family and friends who deal with access to life-saving medications every time there is some sort of bureaucratic hurdle as well as every time there is a cost hurdle. There's an impact on uptake. So Moderna needs to kind of own its public health responsibility and disclose the effects of its price hikes so that the public and Congress can hold the company accountable if the price hike discourages millions of Americans from getting vaccines. Um, and I know you want to work on that too, but this we, we really are going to need data here. And I'm looking forward to seeing the company produce it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Markey. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, welcome, sir. Um, in the dark days of 2020, uh, it was the partnership between the federal government and state government, research centers, um, uh, and uh, companies like Moderna uh, that made it possible for us to make a huge medical breakthrough. Uh, and it was places like the National Institutes of Health and health systems and companies, communities, and getting people vaccinated. That was the real triumph. People young and old at every income got their shots for free. Uh, we helped to lift the weight off of hospitals and brought the innovation of Cambridge to community health centers and communities around the world. But now the list price of COVID vaccines may more than quadruple. Uh, and the cost of high drug prices is that families may need to pay higher health care premiums, health care providers may struggle to afford doses for their patients, and uninsured people may not get vaccinated at all. And even one person not getting vaccinated because they can't afford it is a health system failure. So biopharmaceutical innovation can cure disease, extend lives, and end epidemics, and they should be praised for that. But the real power of that innovation comes from guaranteeing that every community, no matter of their income or zip code, has access. So during the height of the crisis, it cost about $26 uh, per patient for the federal government to vaccinate an individual. So for a family of four, that's $104. Uh, the price you're now talking about, uh, $130 uh, times four for a family of four, brings that price out to $520 for a family of four, up from $104. So you can see why we're so concerned. That's a huge price increase. Uh, it's clearly going to be limiting access for many people in our society. And so my question to you is, do you have a way of lowering that price even further? Have you finished all of your calculations? Because just by pricing it at that level, hmm. our country's going to see millions of people unable to be able to afford it. And if they can afford it, it's only because insurance premiums are going to be going up for them and for Americans across the country. Can you lower it any further? Thank you, Senator, for your question. So let me start with access. Because of how things are set up in the country, people that are insured will have no out-of-pocket. People that are not insured who are currently working on a program uh, and want to make sure it's as easy as possible to access it so that people who are not insured also have access to a vaccine uh, at no cost. That is really, really important to us. The big unknown for us as we move forward is the unknown and the complexity. We do not know what volume will be required in the fall of 23. We do not know how much wastage there will be in the country. If you look at the fall of 22, and I think this is interesting data to think about and reflect upon, U.S. government bought 160 million doses. 50 only million went into arms. So the true cost to the U.S. taxpayer was way above $26 because they paid for all the doses that ended up going to waste. And so this does not include 
the cost of distribution, which now we're going to have to bear. So over time, we'll have to see where things stabilize in terms of volume. And I, and I appreciate that. It's only that as time goes on, identifying where the waste is becomes easier and easier because of experience. Uh, so obviously, that was a, a, an absolute rush that we were in. Uh, but as time goes on, you get better in terms of efficiencies. Uh, in, in logistics, in making sure that uh, the number of people who we think are going to be wanted are matched up within a logistical system that gets it to them. So I guess what I would say to you is that it's important to uh, be looking at additional efficiencies, yeah. additional ways you can lower this price uh, because it's going to be critical to making Americans feel they can afford it. And Following on that, Moderna announced that you have developed a potential cancer treatment for melanoma using mRNA technology, which is an exciting development in cancer treatment. But Merck's cancer drug list price is $175,000, $175,000. And it generated $21 billion in revenue while patients skip treatment or take on significant medical debt. So. Mr. Bensal, how can you use your role to ensure that the cancer drugs you're developing are affordable for people who are going to need them? Thank you, Senator, for your question. That's something we will look into it uh, as time goes by closer to launch. At this time, our focus is to start the phase three study as fast as we can, because we believe, as you said, the data is very encouraging, you know, 44% reduction of recurrence of disease on melanoma or deaths. So it's a big impact on patients. Uh, and as we get closer to launch, we'll have to figure out, we have to even invent how to manufacture those drugs. Because unlike the vaccine, which we make in larger batches, this is an individualized medicine. So we'll make a different one for you or for me if we have cancer, because we'll have to adapt to the gene of our disease. So we'll have to figure all those things out. A, a, a drug that is unaffordable is an hallucination to ordinary people in our country. So it has to be made yeah. more affordable. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Bansal, thank you for being with us today. Um, we've heard a lot of numbers thrown around today. So my goal here is to try to shed some light on them and, and see if we can clear some things up. Um, I have a series of yes or no questions for you, sir. Uh, before the COVID vaccine, Moderna had never had a vaccine approved. Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. Yes or no, BARDA provided Moderna $1.7 billion to support clinical trials related to COVID vaccine? Th that's correct, Senator. And yes or no, the federal government promised and provided $10 billion in guaranteed advanced purchase orders if Moderna successfully developed a vaccine? That discussion happened later, Senator. It was, it was different from the BARDA discussion. That sounds like a long way of saying yes. Okay. Is the, is the answer to that question yes or no? Can, can you repeat the question, please, sir? Yes or no, the federal government promised and provided $10 billion in guaranteed advanced purchase orders if Moderna successfully developed a vaccine. It was actually in tranche, Senator. It was not $10 billion at the beginning. The government started by ordering $100 million and had the right well, to order we, more. We can have a disagreement there. I think if I go back and look at the facts here, the federal government guaranteed $10 billion. Um, we can, if you'd like some time to clear that up, I can submit a question to the record. Yes or no, that deal allowed Moderna to secure early supplies of component parts to speed up production? Uh, actually, no, Senator. We had to raise capital in the public market in May of 2020, 1.3 billion. Did getting a 10 billion guarantee help you raise more money from the market? We did not have that guarantee. That the purchase agreement. Was okay, I'm going to move on. I appreciate that. So you, you disagree with the question that I asked? Yes. Okay. Um, despite the federal government investing early and heavily in Moderna, the federal government has been repeatedly asked to increase its payment per dose. Yes or no, the federal government most recently bought boosters from Moderna at about $26? I think that's correct, sir. For the record, the $26 price represents a 73% increase in the price per dose compared to the last purchase the general government made in June of 2021 when it was $16.52 per dose? It is because of a discount, sir. As I mentioned, we provided a discount for the initial purchase, equivalent to $2.9 billion of discount to reimburse BARDA, 
increase pro why the initial price in 2020 was much lower. I appreciate you sharing that response, Mr. Benson. I've heard it a few times today. Pharmaceutical companies set the price. There's been a whole conversation about this. There is a low price, then there's a lowest price, and then there's a brokered price, and then there's a discount price, but you still make money. <laughs> so I, I, I'd like to have a, another hearing maybe on that, Mr. Chairman, um, so that we understand indeed what the lowest price is. Because if there's a low price and then there's a discount offered, the company agrees through negotiation to offer the discounted price, and I'm certain you're still making money on that. Um, now, that may be my bias and my very elementary understanding of a very complex um, uh, industrial um, uh, a complex here, but nonetheless, I, I'd like to move on there and very much appreciate your explanation of the discount um, and pointing that to the $26 and $16.52. While the huge purchaser like the federal government likely received a discount for bulk, which you just des described, smaller purchasers were still paying a higher price. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And they were paying $37 per dose or $32 to $37 per dose? Does that sound correct? Which, which, which customer, Senator? The volume purchasers. Outside the U.S., you mean? Because in the yes. U.S., we have only one customer of the yes. U.S. government. Outside the U.S., it depends on volume, yes. Yeah, Moderna announced that it plans to sell the vaccine in commercial market from 110 to 130, which is a 400% increase. Is that correct? That's the price we're intending to sell it at. So there's still about 30% of Americans that Moderna estimates will still need a shot. That's a lot of people. And in 2002, yes or no, Mr. Bunsell, Moderna matched the $3.3 billion it spent on research and development with $3.3 billion in stock buyback? In 2022, yeah, it's correct, sir. Now, Jamie Dimon, who's the CEO of Chase, some of you may know who he is, he once described stock buybacks as one of the last uses of excess capital, particularly after investing in growth. Um, I, I'm trying to understand the, the, the statements that have been put forth by Moderna here. According to your last call earning, you have $18 billion cash on hand and you plan to only spend $4.5 billion on additional R&D over the next year. For a company that has never had a commercial drug product before the COVID vaccine, that's a lot of profit. And where I'll conclude here, Mr. Chairman, is I, 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 I support people doing well and profits in this regard, this was a national pandemic and I'm sorry, people are still getting sick and dying from COVID. That's real. Whether people want to admit that or not, that's real. This just seems, it's hard for me to understand here. The cash you're sitting on, your projections, looking at what the US government did, not just with investment, but accelerated treatment when it came to attention to approving a drug that was gonna save people's lives. And I appreciate everyone that was responsible for this. I'm just having a hard time with this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Lujan. Uh, I'm gonna ask some additional questions, then give the mic over to Senator Cassidy. The issue we're really discussing today, and Senator Lujan raised it, I think, significantly, is some of us have a hard time understanding how a company that made $21 billion in profit, a company that enabled you and your associates to become multi-billionaires, a company that would not have developed this vaccine without the help of the taxpayers of this country, now comes before the public and says, oh, by the way, we want to quadruple prices which will mean that the deficit goes up or taxes go up because of the increased expense that Medicare and Medicaid and VA have to pay. So I, I, I concur with Senator Lujan uh, about that issue. I want to ask you or earlier in response to Senator Smith, you talked about uh, negotiating prices. Uh, am I hearing from you that in fact you are prepared not to charge $130 uh, for a vaccine to the U.S. government, but less than that. Is that what I hear? What I'm saying, uh, Mr. Chairman, is there's a list price. It depends if it's a single dose product or pre filled syringe product. There's a list price around $130. And then with different customers, there are going to be discussions. Uh, but, you know, that's an issue that 
many have raised, we have no transparency in pricing. It is a totally insane situation. Everybody pays a different price. The United States government helped you develop that vaccine. It is a huge consumer. Are you prepared to substantially charge less for the vaccine to the United States government and our agencies? Given the situation at hand, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have no idea of the volume that we need this year. We have very increased complexity. Yeah, you have complexity, but you have money for stock buybacks by the billions, and you guys became billionaires. That doesn't seem too complex to me. Let me ask you this question, at least. The United States pays, the people in our country pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs in general, something this committee will work on. Will you at least tell us today that the price you are charging for the vaccine will be lower than what other countries around the world are paying? Or are, once again, we're going to pay the highest prices? So, Mr. Chairman, the price will depend on the value in each country. The cost of health care is different in each now, country. That's not the answer. That's a whole, all right. I'm asking you a simple question. Your vaccine was developed with the help of the United States government. I am asking you whether or not we are going to continue to pay the highest prices in the world for that vaccine. I understand everything is complex, but I also understand you have money for stock buybacks and exorbitant compensation packages for yourself. Will you at least tell the taxpayers of this country that the price we pay for the vaccine will be less than other countries? I cannot, I cannot say that the price will be lower than other countries. All right, let me ask you this. Um, You know, when you talk about value, it's an interesting philosophical concept. In your judgment, what does value mean to a woman who lost her husband because the family cannot afford the price, the outrageous price of a prescription drug? Is that a value that we should consider, or is it only, is that a value that we could, should consider? We believe in access. Mr. Chairman, and as I said, our products, we're going to work really hard for the uninsured that they are available for no cost. And I understand. I, I, I may be asking you a broader question than just Moderna. Uh, Senator Markey mentioned Pfizer having a, a cancer drug for 175000 I believe, is what he said. All right? Uh, what believe, you, yeah, another company. That's another company. Of course, I know that. But I'm asking your statement. Is You talk about value, and the value is, well, we've helped the economy, and We've done all these things, true enough. But what about the value of the human lives that are lost or the suffering while companies make billions and people can't afford the price? Is that a value to be considered? Of course, Mr. Chairman. We need to work together, industry and the governments and all the players in the healthcare system to figure out how do we make sure the products are available. I completely agree with you. We work hard to make medicine and to do science to help people. So I agree with you. Well, you raise an interesting question. Okay, that's, and Senator Cassidy, you know, and Senator Romney talked about it. Now, tell me this, and this is kind of a value issue that I think we should really get into as a nation. Jonas Salk, you're familiar with Jonas Salk, invented polio, did not make billions for his invention. In fact, he gave it away. And he said, I'm so proud to have created this vaccine this to save lives. Alexander Fleming developed penicillin, a huge advance for medicine, saved what, millions of lives? Frederick Banting sold his intellectual property for one dollar for insulin. All right. What do you think about those guys and those scientists who said, you know what? Our function in life is to create wonderful drugs that will ease human suffering and save lives, not to become excessively rich. Do you think they were crazy? I think what they did was very noble. I think what we have to do is to invest in the technology. If we didn't have a technology when the pandemic happened, there would have been no more than a vaccine, Mr. Chairman. Look, we all agree that we need the technology. But what I am asking you, and some of my friends here are saying, is that the only thing that motivates you is to become a billionaire. That, that's not true. All right. But then can we have a science where people get paid well? I have no problem with Moderna making money. But you're hearing here massive cash paybacks, you becoming a multi-billionaire. 
Do we, should we develop a counterculture, perhaps, which says your motive is not just making billions, but developing all of the drugs we need for the terrible diseases that this world faces? And that's what we're doing, Mr. Chairman. That's always why Moderna is a different company. Our number one investment this year is in R&D. As I mentioned, $4.5 billion. As, as How I mentioned, much do you put in stock buybacks? Sorry? How much do you provide in stock buybacks? We have not decided yet as a board. The, the number of a stock buyback that's still open is 2.8 billion, I think. Yeah. Our number one priority is R&D. If we could invest more in R&D, we would. The, the challenge we have is phase three studies takes time to happen, Mr. Chairman. All right, let me ask you this. And again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm directing it to you, but it really applies to the whole industry. If we were to say to you, if the government were to say to you, look, we're interested in cures and cancer, obviously, uh, diabetes, all the other, Alzheimer's, all the other terrible illnesses we face. We are prepared to make sure that your company makes a good profit. Maybe you don't become a multi-billionaire, but you make a good profit. And if you develop a cure for that particular disease, you're going to make money on it, but we're going to take the intellectual property and make it available to the whole world so that people all over the world at a very reasonable price will be able to benefit from that discovery. You make money, the world benefits. Everybody affords it. What do you think about that concept? So what is really hard in this industry, Mr. Chairman, is the risk of failure. Most drugs fail. 90 plus percent of drugs in clinical trial fail, as you are aware. And that's what makes it really, really hard. What we want to do is to get access. Let me share, please, a couple examples. We are working on having a plant in Kenya to help low-income country. There's an example of a rare disease called Kigler Najar. It's very small, 100, 200 kids. We did, couldn't find a way to do it or it'll be too expensive. Right, but if we said to you, yeah. all right, we're gonna cover, you're not gonna fail, you'll be compensated. All right, we're willing to pay you good money. You're gonna get rich, maybe not a multi-billionaire. You'll do very, very well. We'll cover the risk. But if you succeed, that formulation is going to be available to people all over the world so that they can get that drug. We covered the risk. What do you think about that? I will have to look into the details, Mr. Chairman, because, it, again, the risk is I don't know how you, you manage the risk. I mean, are you suggesting in that thought process that the government will pay all of R&D of the entire yeah, industry? Yeah, exactly what I'm suggesting. Oh, okay. That's the deal. We're going to cover the R&D. You succeed. You're going to make profit but the product goes all over to the world so that people can afford it. I, I think we'd have to understand the details to, to have an opinion. See, Mr. Senator Chairman. Markey made the point that I think millions of people appreciate. You can come up with all the great drugs in the world, we appreciate that, but if people can't access them, or they go broke, or they go bankrupt having to buy them, it doesn't mean anything to those people. And certainly, by the way, we're talking about America, the wealthiest country on earth. What about Africa and poor people around the world? Should they die because they cannot afford that prescription drug? Senator Cassidy. Uh, I will be very short. Uh, one, I applaud those like Bantine and Best and others like Maurice Hillerman who developed vaccine and made them generally available. But I also want to quote in 1962 on a Senate hearing on drug development and the role of patents, Dr. Vannevar Bush, uh, who's kind of famous for his role in the development of science in the United States. At the time, uh, he was the former head of the U.S. Office of Scientific Research and Development. He also led the first National Research and Development Council and contributed to the Manhattan Project. And he lamented that, that Fleming, when he discovered penicillin, didn't seek a patent saying that if he had, we would have had penicillin 10 years earlier than we finally got it. Um, so I say that because I've learned, having emerged from a hospital for the uninsured, that there's an ecosystem of investors. And when you are a startup with really no assets, there are investors who invested in your company, as Senator Romney said, maybe taking a loss, but maybe winning big. They could have invested in anything else, but they invested in you. And they did it because they anticipated a return. Some of them got it. Some of them did not. Now, if they invested in a startup that failed, they lost their money. So I say that because it isn't just so much the company that is established. There may be legitimate beefs. But if we're speaking about a company starting, I've learned that there is an ecosystem and they cannot get money unless that investor yeah. can see a return on that which she has put forward. Um, no need to comment. With that, I yield. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Bansell, thank you very much for being with us this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And now we're going to call uh, our next panel.
Uh, our first witness will be Dr. Christopher Morton. Our next witness will be Dr. Amit Umit Sarputarari. And our third witness will be Dr. Craig Garthwaite. Uh, let me thank, let me thank all of our witnesses for being with us and for your patience. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Um, let's begin with Dr. Christopher Morton, who is an associate clinical professor of law at Columbia Law School. Dr. Morton is trained as an organic chemist and lawyer. He is a leading expert on equitable access to medicine. Uh, Dr. Morton, thanks for being here. Um, Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and distinguished members, thank you for this hearing and for inviting me to testify. mRNA-based COVID vaccines are among the most important inventions of my lifetime. They have saved millions of lives. For two years, we, the people of the United States, had free access to these vaccines because our government purchased large quantities at affordable prices and distributed them for free. But that sadly is changing. The U.S. government will leave Americans on our own to foot the bill. Moderna has proposed massive price increases from $20 or $30 a dose to $110 or even $130, though each dose costs less than $3 to make. Moderna's proposed price increases will mean that people who need boosters won't get them. More people will get sick and die. Higher vaccine prices hurt us all. Higher prices mean higher insurance costs, including higher Medicare premiums. Mr. Bansell claims the value of these vaccines justifies Moderna's proposed price increases. But his testimony ignored a key question. Who created that value? It was the US government, the American taxpayer, that spent billions. It was government scientists that toiled alongside Moderna's. To quote Monsef Slawi, former head of Operation Warp Speed and a Moderna board member, the US government, quote, held Moderna by the hand on a daily basis, unquote. Moderna is not the primary inventor of any of the three key scientific features of the NIH Moderna vaccine that Moderna itself has identified as critical to its value. We gave Moderna the specific mRNA sequence used in the vaccine. We designed and ran Moderna's early clinical trials. We gave Moderna money and resources to expand its manufacturing. The National Institutes of Health was so integral that it aptly named the vaccine the NIH Moderna vaccine built on over a decade of pioneering research into coronaviruses at NIH. Yet Moderna has repeatedly exaggerated its own contributions and downplayed or even erased essential government support at almost every stage. For example, Moderna's lawyers intentionally omitted NIH scientists as inventors of a key patent application, the same NIH scientists who sent Moderna the vaccine's precise mRNA sequence. To quote NIH, Omitting NIH inventors from the principal patent application deprives NIH of a co-ownership interest, unquote. And Mr. Bensell just confirmed a moment ago that Moderna abandoned that patent application rather than share control with NIH. To be clear, Moderna's scientists and engineers made many contributions of their own, as did many academic scientists. These people and their work deserve credit and celebration too. But Moderna cannot claim the vaccine's value for itself. And the American people, the most important creators of the value of this vaccine, deserve a voice in the debate over the company's prices. To quote Senator Casey, our partnership should not be extinguished just because we think the pandemic is over. To justify price increases, Moderna also points to $4.5 billion in R&D commitments this year. But $4.5 billion is easily doable for this company. In 2021 and 22, Moderna made over $20 billion in profits. The company has been so spectacularly successful that many of its executives and early investors became billionaires, including Mr. Bansell. As I speak right now, Mr. Bansell's net worth is reportedly about $4.7 billion, meaning he might be rich enough to fund Moderna's entire 2023 uh, R&D expenditure out of his own pocket. In 2022, Moderna spent $3.3 billion on stock buybacks to enrich Mr. Bansell and other shareholders. That's as much as the company spent on R&D last year. Moderna's price increases are unjustifiable. 
If we let them happen, we set a terrible policy precedent. Other companies will double down on Moderna's playbook, extract billions in private profits from public science and public money, leave Americans with higher costs in accessible technologies and poorer health. I urge Moderna, do not raise your prices. Your vaccine is clearly profitable at $20 a dose. And if Moderna insists on higher prices, our leaders should act. I'll make two recommendations now, and I present more in my um, written testimony. First, Congress and the White House should work together to resume bulk purchases of COVID vaccines. Continue to use the buying power of the American people and provide vaccines free of charge to everyone. Second, NIH and other scientific agencies must cut harder bargains with their industry partners so that we, the people, get access to the next generation of medical products that our money creates and that we need to survive and thrive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next witness is Dr. Amit Sapatwari, who is an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Uh, he is an epidemiologist and a lawyer. He is an expert on the role of public investment in driving new medical breakthroughs. Doctor, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you. Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and distinguished members of the Senate Help Committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I urge you today to strongly condemn and swiftly act to prevent Moderna's attempt to quadruple the price of the NIH Moderna vaccine, which would fill the company's coffers with unmerited public funds and severely threaten public health. The reasons why center on the extraordinary role the federal government played in Moderna's success and the substantial barrier to access that this price increase would have. Building on $337 million in pre-pandemic funding of research directly contributing to key investments in mRNA vaccines, the federal government made a series of unprecedented investments in multiple pharmaceutical companies to develop a vaccine under Operation Warp Speed. Moderna was one of the largest beneficiaries, receiving over $2 billion to support clinical trials of the NIH Moderna vaccine, $1.5 billion in an advanced market purchase for a then unapproved product, and over $50 million to scale up manufacturing. In this respect, the federal government turned traditional therapeutic development on its head. The brunt of the risk for which we reward pharmaceutical companies the ability to charge monopoly-like pricing was borne by taxpayers. Moderna's benefits from the federal government didn't end there. NIH scientists co-developed the mRNA sequence encoding the vaccine's immunogen and independently developed the vaccine's spike protein. Moderna was also granted broad immunity against patent infringement for use of other patented technologies which the company has cited as a defense in ongoing litigation. Through these federal government contributions, Moderna, a company that had never brought a product to market, was able to secure emergency use authorization of the NIH Moderna vaccine, benefiting handsomely from its use. Moderna earned $37 billion in revenue in 2021 and 2022, $20 billion of which was profit. Despite these riches, Moderna has at every turn sought to enrich itself further at the expense of Americans and the global South. In the US, Moderna has already denied the pivotal contributions of the federal government in the development of the NIH Moderna vaccine and broken its pledge not to enforce its patents during the pandemic. In October 2021, as the pandemic raged globally, Moderna was supplying its doses almost exclusively to wealthy nations, more so than any other manufacturer. Moderna's price increase is an escalation in this troubling pattern of behavior and a step too far. It cannot be justified based on the value of the vaccine, which was created on the backs of taxpayers and with essential contributions of NIH scientists. It also cannot be justified on the need for research and development. Moderna had ample funds for this. Flush with money, it maximized short-term profit. In 2022, Moderna spent more on stock buybacks than it did on research and development. Moderna's offer of a patient assistance program is no solution. 
These programs are often complicated with applications that take considerable time to complete and frequent changes in eligibility as well as onerous income documentation requirements. We've received no details of this patient assistance program to date. Given these barriers, it is likely that many Americans will be miss booster shots uh, and this will result in more infections and more deaths, particularly among vulnerable populations. The public will also still bear the full cost of an unconscionable price increase. Now is the time to say enough. The federal government should resume purchasing doses for all Americans, leveraging its purchasing power to obtain a fair price. Such an act would not threaten innovation or the willingness of companies to race for a cure in a subsequent pandemic. Instead, it would demonstrate a dual commitment to allow pharmaceutical companies to profit handsomely for their efforts under reduced risk and to ensure reasonable access to Americans in a time of crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next panelist was invited by Senator Cassidy, who's now voting, but I'm happy to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Craig R. Gothwaite is the Herman R. Smith Research Professor in Hospital and Health Services at Northwestern University. He is an applied economist whose research examines the business of healthcare. Uh, Dr. Gothwaite, thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you, Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and members of the committee for inviting me to testify today. Today's hearing is about Moderna's decision to raise prices for his COVID vaccine and some members of the committee's desire to push back on that increase. While potentially well-intentioned, the government's attempts to stop this price increase could impact drug development well beyond both Moderna and the COVID-19 pandemic. When the government provided what is undisputably a large amount of funding to Moderna, it did so without regulatory conditions on future pricing. It's inappropriate to now attempt to relitigate that question after Moderna accepted the funding. To put it quite simply, the correct time for government officials to discuss price restrictions with Moderna was before they finalized the funding agreement. Facing such potential restrictions on future profits, Moderna could have weighed its options and made the optimal choice for its investors, who we'll note, we will note already provided $3 billion in private capital at that point. We chose not to walk down that road, likely because we knew it would delay the process of getting the life-saving vaccine we so desired. That was a policy choice and one we should abide by. Moderna, perhaps ultimately naively, trusted the government would honor its commitments and not try to enact ex post modifications to the funding agreements. Notably, Pfizer had a different view, and Pfizer's CEO would also know it was, not, it was not in attendance today. Trust of that nature, trust in the government, is critical to our overall system for drug development. And for that reason, while we gather today to ostensibly discuss vaccine pricing, we're actually having a far broader conversation about how economic markets can continue to provide new innovations for patients. Such markets are central to discovering novel uh, pharmaceutical products. In those markets, we provide firms making large investments in drug development with a time-limited period where they can profit from these successful innovations. In this way, we trade off some reduction in access today from higher prices for the incentives for firms to invest in future products. These incentives are critical drivers of innovation that provide access to patients who might otherwise be left without any treatments for horrendous medical conditions. Over the past several decades, the world has enjoyed tremendous benefits from this free market system of drug development. Patients with diagnoses that previously amounted to death sentences have been completely cured or now have entirely manageable chronic conditions. Despite this progress, many other patients struggle with serious unmet medical conditions, and many others die every year because treatments simply do not exist for their, or their condition yet. In debates about pharmaceutical pricing, access to medications for these individuals is all too often left unmentioned when we discuss the morality of drug pricing and access. These patients depend on firms being willing to continue to invest in future innovations. After all, few of our existing treatments came to market without meaningful private investment. Firms make such investments when they believe there are clear and identifiable rules that govern how they will earn potential returns from successful innovations and a trustworthy regulatory state to enforce those rules. Historically, the United States government has admirably served in this trustworthy role. But I fear private firms watching these hearings, along with other recent policy actions and statements regarding government price regulations and margin rights, are beginning to doubt the future wisdom of this trust. Understanding the potentially broader ramifications of a loss in trust in government does require acknowledging the incontrovertible fact 
that new pharmaceutical products are developed in an expensive ecosystem where private firms invest large amounts of fixed and sunk capital with little certainty of a profitable return. While there may be some limited anecdotal evidence of altruistic individuals giving up profits solely to benefit society, these examples are unfortunately exceedingly rare. Hoping such altruistic funding will emerge from the ether is simply not a strategy for drug development. Instead, we must accept the reality that the private firms crucial to drug development can only attract the capital they need if they can generate a risk-adjusted return for their investors that is sufficiently attractive compared to other non-pharmaceutical investments. And most of these investments ultimately fail. Firms can withstand these failures because a small number of large successful investments support a larger number of failed projects. If firms believe that policymakers will ultimately expropriate the gains from investments that are deemed too successful, they will not, and they will not invest in the first place and we get fewer products. And as much as we may not like it, this is true even when it means allowing firms to capture large windfalls from products that generate massive amounts of value for society. And if we choose to ignore this fact, in favor of specious arguments and grandstanding about pharmaceutical greed, we will clearly forfeit access to future medical innovations. That said, our goal is not to provide firms with unlimited returns on their investment. We must aim to balance the incentives necessary to attract private capital with the ability of patients to access the resulting medical innovations, and I provide numerous suggestions to that end in my written testimony. Regardless of the choices that we make, it is critical that we understand that if we decrease spending on healthcare or on pharmaceuticals, we will get fewer products. That might be acceptable. We might want less innovation and lower prices, but that is the debate we should have. We should be debating how much innovation are we willing to give up, not falling for promises that we will have lower spending and the same level or more prices. Thank you, Senator Sanders and Senator Cassidy. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by asking, um, Dr. Morton and Dr. Sapatwari, uh, their assessment of uh, Mr. Bansell's uh, remarks. Dr. Morton. Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, there's a lot in Mr. Bansell's remarks. Um, I might start with his claim that the US government has already been repaid somehow um, by Moderna for its contributions to the NIH Moderna vaccine. Um, I think I heard Mr. Bansell say that we have already received something like $2.9 billion in benefit from the company. Um, he describes this as a discount that was granted to the American public back in 2020 and 2021 when we were purchasing hundreds of millions of doses. Um, this is revisionist history. Um, this is sort of a new telling that Moderna has come up with, um, I think, since this committee um, called this hearing. Um, at the time that we cut these deals, these were negotiated prices between a, a buyer and a seller. Um, Moderna sold its doses for about $20 a dose, um, similar to what Pfizer sold its doses for, similar to what Moderna sold um, its own product uh, for overseas. Um, and so to view it as a discount, I think, is artificial and very much post hoc. Thank you. Uh, Let me go to Dr. Uh, Sapatwari. Microphone. Thank you. I'd also like to touch upon the issue of the discount. I don't believe it was a discount in return for the government's contribution to drug development. Moderna was a smaller company. It was a company in which if it invested in, there was more risk. Uh, the actual guarantee that Moderna got was a, a guaranteed purchase even if the product was unapproved. That differs from other purchases under Operation Warp Speed. So Mr. Bansell has at times attempted to justify the price increase on the grounds of increased costs. It seems to be a little bit improbable that a hundredfold increased cost would be there with distribution systems that already exist. But that's not really what irks me so much. What irks me is that at times he justifies it on the basis of cost, at times he justifies it on the basis of value. He can't have his cake and eat it too. I think that what we're seeing here is the privatization of gain and the socialization of risk, which is not a sustainable way to operate. Good. I, I want to uh, ask uh, both of you, uh, you know, pick up on a point that Dr. Gothwaite and many others have made. In the world right now and in our country, there are people who are suffering and dying because they cannot afford 
the high cost of prescription drugs. It's true in the United States. It's certainly true in poor countries around the world. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are probably millions of people dying of preventable, curable diseases simply because the price of medicine is too high. In your judgment, is there another model out there that addresses the issue of making sure that when a drug is developed, a life-saving drug, its goal is not just to make huge profits for the drug company, but to make it accessible to people all over the world. What am I missing in saying that there's something cruel and immoral of people dying and suffering in America and all over the world who cannot afford medicine, which often costs, as in the case of this vaccine, a few dollars to produce, really cheap. What do you think about the morality? And give me alternatives to saying, hey, I got to make billions. I don't care if you die. Is there another model that will create the drugs? Dr. Gothway talked about the need to create new drugs. We all want to do that. Is that the only model to say you got to, only way to do it is to make billions and people die? Is there another model out there? Who wants to take a response to that? Dr. Morton? Sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, Senator, that is a truly uh, uh, essential question, I think, in this moment. Um, I will respectfully disagree with my, my colleague, Professor Garthwaite. I think he said something like, hmm. if we decrease spending, we will get fewer products. It suggests a kind of uh, a zero-sum game. I think that's a false trade-off. I think there are genuinely transformative options available. The NIH Moderna vaccine proves this. Uh, the NIH Moderna vaccine is not a story of the triumph of the free market. It's a story of the triumph of public science and public-private uh, public partnership. We have incredible resources at the NIH and other scientific agencies. We can unleash these. We can do public sector pharmaceutical R&D development manufacturing, and we can cut better deals with industry when they come to NIH and other agencies um, to take some of our great technology to market. Dr. Sopert, uh, Wari, what's your thought? So there definitely are other models, and the rest of the world use them. Um, for, so one model that I'm, I'm thinking about is just to actually gauge the value of the product um, and base the price off of that. Two-thirds of drugs that have been proved you know, in one past year that we took a look at were actually rated by health technology assessment committees as offering no greater value than what exists today. So what we need to do is not treat innovation as a blank word. Innovation needs to mean clinically meaningful. And in that case, when something is clinically meaningful, I think we do owe, vac we do owe manufacturers uh, a, a good profit on their development. And I think that in those cases, we need to make sure that insurance is there to make sure that millions of Americans can afford these therapies. I do see it as a moral failure, and I think that we do have an obligation that we are failing the American people. Dr. Garthwaite, I used your name, and you can respond. Do you see any other model, any other choice, other than saying you're going to become a billionaire, but people can't afford your product? Is there another model to get this science and innovation to people who need it all over the world? We, we could certainly have the NIH increase its its funding of drugs. I know right now that the NIH doesn't actually bring drugs to market. They do early stage development. Right. As Dr. My, my, my colleague, Dr. Morton, pointed out, the NIH did partner with Moderna, but they did, you know, however much we want to sort of downplay Moderna's role here, there was $3 billion spent on getting a platform up and running for them. So there, there is a role for the private market to work together. I will note, though, that the NIH currently spends a mere fraction of what the private capital markets uh, apply, or supply to drug developers, something in the order of like one-fourth of what the private market has. So you would have to have the government step in, and then the government be, as well as be able to allocate that capital in a way government has never shown it's able to do. And that's the But problem. if the result was, taking your point, if the result was that we took that product after the companies made their fair share of profits and provided it to the world, to everybody in this country, at an affordable rate. Don't you think, from a social and moral perspective, that would be a huge step forward? I believe I was pretty clear in my testimony that we could have had that conversation with Moderna before we gave I'm them the money. I'm not talking about Moderna. We could have the conversation with anyone beforehand, Senator, but you want to come back now after you give people money with no restrictions okay. and then relitigate the deal, and that means people won't trust the government anymore. Okay. And that matters, and I think it should matter to you. 
Okay, send them to custody. Yeah, before I start, Senator Paul asks I submit these documents for the record. I ask unanimous consent um, that these documents related to myocarditis associated with the COVID-19 vaccine be, um, uh, be entered into the record. Without objection. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, I've now learned in academia, you better have a beard. <laughs> That's the one thing that seems to unite you all. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'll start with you, Mr. Garthwaite. Um, I actually think that the federal government actually copied best practices from the private sector in the development of the vaccine. I spoke to some people once involved with angel, angel investing in venture capital, et cetera. They find a clinical problem. They find the researcher that's done the best work. They work backwards and fund that researcher, and that researcher on that problem identified as essential, think ALS, uh, which they're currently doing, then develops a product from which the investors make a return, uh, which is essentially what we did with the COVID vaccine. We got an issue. Who can do the work? We're going to fund you. Then we're going to bring it forward. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think in many ways you could think of it operating like a venture capital or an angel investing firm where we had like a very specific target we needed to hit and the government could be the venture capitalist for that. As the world gets more complicated, as we think about different pathways for treating diseases and different diseases, I just question whether the government's gonna be a good venture capitalist, given all of the other- I accept that. You yeah. don't have to argue that with okay. me, brother. All right. Okay. <laughs> I was worried for a second, but- and then Not at all. Uh, Dr. Morton, Dr. Uh, Sobertari, um, you're, when I read your testimony, you're trying to build a case that the government has a right to march in or to dictate a price. Um, you know, did they, did they or did they not uh, collaborate effectively or eventually or whatever on the development of the science, et cetera? But that really goes beyond, passes, if you will, the point that Dr. Garthwaite makes the and what, what the CEO of Moderna made. If you're going to negotiate some limitation on how the price when we commercialize, then do it beforehand. Don't come back afterwards and ask to negotiate. Do it beforehand. That's, that's really the crux of the matter. And when I read your testimonies, it seems as if you're building a rationale to circumvent that crux. Dr. Martin, I'll start with you. Any thoughts? And be brief because I got limited time. Yeah, thanks, Senator. Um, I think it is regrettably true that in 2020, the U.S. government, um, the Trump administration, did not extract from Moderna a clear contractual obligation to share control with NIH or to um, set affordable prices. But it is clear from the record that NIH and Moderna were partners. They had yeah, an but understanding. That's beside the point. Well, the, but, the, that's, that's, so sir, and I, I don't mean because your, your testimony is all about that, but that's really beside the point. They did not negotiate before. And so, Dr., and I'm limited to time, I'm sorry. Dr. Subtwari, uh, I'm sorry if I'm not getting your name correct. I apologize. Serpentwari. Serpentwari. Yes. Yeah. So thanks for the question, Senator. I uh, agree that uh, we need to do a better job upstream in negotiating contracts that would have avoided difficulty in this case. But I think there was an understood agreement here that in turn for all the late stage de-risking that was done, that Amer Americans would have affordable access to this. Now you can't, you can't say that it is not affordable if there's gonna be no out-of-pocket exposure for someone despite their coverage. Affordable in two ways, I think, is slightly what I mean. So, first of all, we know... And by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt. That unspoken agreement probably should have been put on paper. Uh, I'm not going to argue with, with that we need to have affordable drugs. But to come back and say it was unspoken is really a wish. It is not something which you can take to a court. Uh, and by the way, we can also argue whether the Trump administration failed. I was there, and feces were hitting the fan, and we were trying to get things done as rapidly as possible. And it's very easy to 2020 retrospecti retrospectively look at things. But anyway, go back to your point. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, and so in terms of affordable, we need to look at the patients who are going to fall through the cracks through these patient assistance programs, which happen. Um, now, you're, 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 you're presuming because it's happened with other PAPs, it's going to happen with this one. Yes, I am. But the testimony is that they're already working with advocates for the homeless in order to make sure the homeless who are often drug-addled and cannot fill out paperwork can get it completed, that sort of thing. So you're prejudging guilt, if you will. No, I don't think so. I'm making an educated uh, assessment based on a vast amount of evidence about these programs. 
I think secondly, when we talk about affordable, we need to think about what public payers are paying for these products because that will limit, in the case of Medicaid, what it can spend in other places. And in the case of Medicare, that's going to result in higher premiums. Well, two things about that. And by the way, if we want to talk about capping, uh, you know, block granting to states or doing a per capita cap on state Medicaid program, right now they have kind of an unlimited budget. And, and obviously that's a problem for the FISC. Um, Dr. Gartway. There's been kind of a sense of, is there a new paradigm by which we could bring things to market? Uh, and by the way, I hope I got your name correctly, too. If, can, we, can we bring things to market uh, with a new paradigm? But I'm told that prior to, 19, prior to the passage of Bayh-Dole, only 5% of basic research was being translated to clinical practice. And Bayh-Dole, which basically said to universities, NIH has funded your research but the university is going to now own the license to the patent. And you can work with private industry if you wish. And that was catalytic to dramatically increase the translational research of the basic science that NIH was funding. Is that a fair interpretation of history? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think we have a, a pretty clear sense that we are now able to commercialize things from what we often refer to as the bench to the bedside, that basic science done sort of at universities, of which a lot of my colleagues who are much smarter than me do, um, is great, but it's only great when it comes to patient welfare to the extent it turns into a drug you can take. And so Bayh-Dole provides a mechanism by which we can commercialize that science, yes. And so basically at that point we waved the white flag and we said to depend upon a federal government basic science researcher, and that's not what she or he is interested in, to commercialize or translate the science is not going to happen. Well, it's, also, it's, just, it's just a capital question, right? All of this is about like, who's going to pay for those next steps and who's going to make the choices about what we select to move forward, where there's this difference between what is good science and what could be a good product. Venture capital does a really good job of taking things out of universities and figuring out what we should commercialize going forward. In which case, they get to set a price, <coughs> which they, we may, may or not like, but nonetheless, that's part of the deal. Yeah, I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather they set the price on a drug that exists than have people like my mother-in-law and others who've died of cancer because there's no treatment that exists for them. With that, I yield. Okay. Uh, let me thank our witnesses. It's good discussion. like to go on further. i got to vote. Uh, Senator Cassidy has another engagement. So this is the end of our hearing today, and, and thank you again. And let me thank Dr. Bansell, uh, Mr. Bansell once more. For any senators who wish to ask additional questions, questions for the record will be due in 10 business days, April 5th by 5 p.m., I ask unanimous consent to enter the record a statement from a stakeholder group about the cost of COVID vaccines, as well as a letter from the NIH about its inventorship of the COVID vaccine and evidence about public funding of Moderna. The committee stands adjourned. Yeah, okay, go down. All right, can you collect all this and, get, and put it on my desk? Okay. Thank you.